Once upon a time, there were three idiots who loved to talk about television, and their names were Jay, Brian, and Tony. And this is the story of the Channel Chasers podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Of course, as always, I am your host, Jay, and I am joined by my two lovely cohorts, Brian and Tony. How you doing tonight, gents? Doing all right. Might have to get in a fight with my TV, but that's nothing unusual. Yeah, no. Uh, you know, for the folks at home yeah. and the folks listening, uh, don't be alarmed. Tony is always is constantly in a fight with technology. He he repeatedly wants to punch yep. technology in the face, even though technology does Which... not have a face. Just real quick housekeeping. So I uh, I've moved editor duties to Brian because I, I i have other obligations that don't give me enough time to, to properly edit and give you guys a a satisfactory product so i you know i pawned that job off to brian hopefully by the time this gets out we'll ha uh, we'll have the two you know episodes that we recorded on the channel and on spotify yeah um but yeah, just wanted to let you guys know that that's the reason the episodes were so delayed. Um, like you know, I, there was a I had a whole family emergency, and it was like it was a whole thing. I'm not gonna go into like deep detail yeah. about it, but uh, you know, I I just wasn't in the right headspace to edit. I just decided, all right, nope, I'm not gonna do what I usually do and just you know put it on my uh, just take it on myself. I'm just gonna ask Brian. Because Tony's, yeah. compu Tony's computer, young bastard, can't handle shit. So I can't ask Tony. For true. Mine is better, but still just, like, keep trucking. Yep. So uh, this week, we will be talking about a movie, uh, a new release on Netflix, the fairy tale inspired whodunit murder mystery, Once Upon a Crime. Get ready for a, for a lot of fairy tale puns and Agatha Christie references. Uh, but before yeah, all that, yes, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna say from a foreign perspective. Oh yeah, yeah, because this is a, this is a Japanese made film. But yeah, before we dive into the main discussion, we're gonna first start by jumping right into the news with Brian. Okay, peoples. So we haven't been talking about the strike in a while. We're not ignoring it. We will talk about it when there are big updates. This isn't really an update. It's a side story, but I thought we'd go ahead and discuss it because it helps highlight the like negative side of the strike. Y'all hear about the Drew Barrymore situation? What's the Drew Barrymore mm -hmm. situation? Well, for those that don't know, Drew Barrymore right now has her own daytime talk yeah, show. Yeah, she has a talk show. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, everybody's been talking about how uh, it's the talk show above talk shows. Like, it's the, like, anti-talk show. Yeah. Where, like, clips have gone viral of her going into the audience because she sees someone crying to make sure that they're okay. She had a very infamous episode where she had a former child star, Jeanette McCurdy, on. Oh, I saw that one. And they both got... Yeah, I saw that one. They it both was... got really real about the yeah growing up as child star. Yeah, because this was uh, this was the one where because uh, she was promoting uh, I'm glad my mom died. And for those that don't remember, Drew Barrymore herself is a former child star. Yep, she was the little sister in E.T. and did several other things. She's Steven Spielberg's well, niece. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, the stinger kill in the first Scream movie. Yes, she was. Yep. But probably her and most iconic yes, she role. Was. Anyway, all that going for her, and then she messes up. Okay. She done goof? Because she started up her show again. All right. Oh. oh. And she was claiming that it was because of the fact that it was under a different thing and didn't have WG you know, people, that this was a total separate thing, like Good Morning America. Which people did the research and they're like, no, Good Morning America can continue to go because it's under news. Yeah. You're not under news. You are just continuing without WGA people. Mm -hmm. You're scabbing. And uh, 
there even was a thing where um, two people, two young college kids, mm -hmm. came in to see one of her shows back, and the WGA was picketing it. Uh -huh. So they gave out pins, and these guys were like, cool. So they just put on the pins and sat down in their seat that they bought. Well, they went to go use the bathroom, and security escorted them off the prom premises because of them wearing the pants that promoted WGA. Ah, oh, shit. And, well, just to show you that, like, what this current generation is like, you know what they did? Uh, posted a yeah. TikTok? They joined the picket line. Oh, good for cool. them. So, instead of spending their time watching the Drew Barrymore show, they were picketing the Drew Barrymore show. Because they still had that time blocked out from their schedule. No, that's uh, that's one that's one thing that's one thing I will really give to the kids is that like you know they are very like steadfast in their ideals, and uh, it, it, it's it's all it's always mm -hmm. it's always good to see you know the next gen the next generation like you know stand for something, and you know yeah. not just yeah. be part of an echo chamber. And then after all this came out, Drew herself went uh, on the internet and posted a video. It was one of those, I'm sorry, but... Oh, so it was a YouTube apology. Uh, kind of. Uh, she didn't over-dramatic play it as much as YouTube apologies. She basically said that she's sorry, but she is going to continue because this is bigger than her. Well, a couple days after she posts that, it comes out that the show is pausing... Until the strike is over. <laughs> and uh, our next story is a weird one, but it's tentatively excited for this. Okay. It's uh, Audible is coming out with a new original story called Slayers, a Buffy Burst story. Oh, I mean, it's not okay. it's not original. Uh, that's, a, that's an actual book series. No. Well, that might be a book series, but this is a completely original story. Oh, I was going to say because I'm, I'm like I'm friend, I'm friends with the author of that series. This might be taking inspiration from that. Yeah, because um, uh, j j j to fill to fill people in on Slayers, just to just to plug the book real quick, it's a continuation of the Buffy verse that has like I want to say it's Willow's kid as the as the lead uh, as the lead Slayer. Buffy ends up getting kidnapped. They uh they end up ha it's it's them basically having to rescue Buffy. It was pretty good. Not, Are you not talking about Christopher Golden? No, no, no. Uh Kendare Blake. Oh, well this this story is being written by Christopher Golden who also has done several Buffyverse comics. Yeah, and he's also and... he also did the Runaways uh Runaways novel. That was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And he's co-writing it with uh, Ashley Benson. From Pretty Little Liars? Nope. Uh, Tara from Buffy. Oh. Oh. Cool. Oh, I remember her. Nice. I remember her. Yeah. This, this is going to be a sequel series as well, where it's going to be about Spike. Who, oh, cool. Who, uh, I think they said like 20 years after... The last season has now moved to L.A. and is, like, undercover in the L.A. supernatural world. That is, until he comes across a new, I think they said, 16-year-old player who he then has to make it his mission to try to find her, her own watcher, and get, like, her off of his hands. And in doing so, he also gets involved in the multiverse and uh why is everything doing the multiverse now well uh, it, it's multiverse but it's only one universe then it's not multi it's, well it's more than one so i thought multiverse would be the best way to explain it okay alternate universe mm -hmm. where he goes to an alternate universe where bobby summers never existed oh. hmm. so instead you know who becomes the slayer of this world? Willow? Nope. Cordelia. Cordelia? What? The best what? girl, Cordelia? Yep. Cordelia is the slayer of this world, and she enlists 
Spike and the new rookie Slayer to help her with look, a great evil. Look, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real with you. I liked Buffy, but I loved Angel. And I loved Angel because of Cordelia. Yeah, but then they did her dirty. Yeah. Not as dirty as they did Fred. Which um people. Charisma Charisma Carpenter is returning. Nice. And she said she said this is gonna be the redemption that we all wished for for Cordelia. Cool. Uh, which, by the way, I, uh, I did. I did just look it up. I found the story I was talking about. It's called "In Every Generation." Uh, so okay. let, let me just read the read the synopsis real quick. The first, not uh, the first, in an all new series by New York Times bestselling author Kendare Blake, uh, continues the world uh, continues the world of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, featuring the next generation of Scoobies and Slayers who. Uh, must defeat a powerful new evil. Uh, a new slayer for a new generation. Frankie Rosenberg uh, is passionate about, passionate about the environment, a sophomore at New Sunnydale High School, and the daughter of the most powerful witch uh, Sunnydale history. Her mom, Willow, is slowly teaching her magic on the condition that she uses it to better the world. But Frankie's happily quiet life is upended when new girl, Haley, shows up with the news that the annual Slayers convention ha uh, has been the target of an attack for on all the Slayers, including Buffy, Faith, and Harley's older sister, Vi. Uh, they all might be dead. Uh, that means it's time for the next generation Slayer to be born. Yeah, so that, so that's the whole that that's the whole thing for that. It's a pretty it's a pretty good series. Nice, but uh, this one. Just to continue what I was saying mm -hmm. is, uh, like I said, Charisma is returning as uh, Cordelia. James Masterson is returning as Spike. Nice. And uh, also returning characters with their respective actors are Giles. <gasps> nice. Anthony Stewart. Hell yeah. yeah. I love Giles. Anya. Nice. Okay. Tara. She's coming in for writing and voicing. Nice. Cool, cool. Uh, Clem. Huh. Clem. And Jonathan. Oh. Okay, we're, 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 getting, we're, getting, some, and we're getting some deep cuts. One again. more big villain of this story. Uh-huh. Who has a special connection to Spike. Uh-huh. <laughs> Drusilla. Oh, oh, shit. Not Drusilla. Not again. I feel yep. like we've done this dance a little too many times, but fuck it, I guess. Homegirl just can't leave well enough alone. That's what I'm saying. And uh, voicing the uh, the new Slayer is a relative unknown. I, I'm i probably going to butcher her name. Indira Nunal. It's probably uh, The best thing that she's known for was, and I'm going to butcher this name again, but she played Ang Angboda. In the God of War Ragnarok. Oh, Angraboda. Uh, oh, yeah, she voiced Angraboda. Yeah, her name is Indra. Yeah. Uh, yeah, her name is Indra. Okay. Yep. She was cool. I lo I loved Angraboda in uh, God of War Ragnarok. So it was, well, she's going to be the main, like, rookie yeah. slayer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. cool. That's cool. interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I and, dig uh, Angraboda. All of this is starting in October 12th. Okay, cool. Mm. Round spooky. It's going to be a, like, multi-part series. Hey, Audible, mm -hmm. I, I say this every time. Your ad could mm -hmm. go here. Just saying. Just, just maybe and, here. <laughs> and uh, for our last story of the week, we're going to go to the open sales one again. And One Piece, then renewed. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I love the announcement message with Oda's Den Den Mushy. I, I've adjusted. I've adjusted to them now. They're they're still weird and unsettling, but they don't terrify me as much as the first time. Uh, yeah, they're they're still cursed cursed things, but they you get used to it over time, like Jay said. Also, now we now One Piece fans officially know that Oda has a mustache because uh, you know we've never seen. Oda outside of his uh, fish head avatar, but the Denden Mushi is supposed to reflect the speaker. So 
And then the Mushy had a pretty awesome mustache. So that means Oda wait, 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 has wait, wait, an wait. awesome mustache. Mm-hmm. Mustache fit was pretty damn solid. Not gonna lie. Yep. And they 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 teased and the, the trailer coming. did also mm-hmm. confirm a future straw hat. Yep, one Tony Tony <laughs> Chopper, which I'm terrified of what they're gonna do because me and Cap have a bet going on of whether it's gonna be a CGI <laughs> nightmare or a practical puppet or worst case scenario, terrible child actor in furry suit. But I said, if they're gonna if they're gonna hire a child actor, just hire Kid Sanji again, because <laughs> Kid Sanji was um, the only child actor who didn't suck. Which yeah. I told them off camera, but it's no surprise because he's the lead in another Netflix show, Sweet Tooth, which also has animal human people and is done pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I so this pretty much confirms <laughs> to me that we are gonna end the season. Uh, with the Drum Island arc, the, you know, aka the Chopper arc. So that pretty much sets the pace for me in terms of knowing where season two is going to go. And it's going to be some interesting stuff. Uh, I am very curious to see if they do a particular part that everyone in the fandom thinks they're going to skip because it has dinosaurs and giants and shit. And Netflix doesn't have dinosaur and giant money. We'll see. Nevertheless, I'm excited. You know, you'll, oh, yeah. you, you'll see with the One Piece episode, if you haven't seen it already, uh, insert card over my head. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it, even though I have a lot of problems with it as a diehard fan. It makes it easier for casuals to understand the greatness of One Piece. And for that, I am eternally grateful. So, you know, I'm still here for it. I'm going to support it. <laughs> And as a non-anime fan, really enjoyed it. Can't wait to see more. As someone who uh, has just a passing relationship with One Piece, I really enjoyed what I saw, mm-hmm. and I want to see more of it. You're gonna have you know? also. You're gonna have to wait till at least I want to say, depending on how they pace this season five or six, to see Boa Hancock. It will be an unfortunate thing, but she's worth the wait. She is worth the wait. Uh, also, that's gonna be an important casting. With the strike and everything, we don't know when this is gonna come out. I mean, so Oda in the announcement says that the scripts are being worked on currently. Yeah. So, uh. I so I followed I followed the production cycle of this movie ever since it was announced. Uh, so I can tell you that with this first season, it took about two years to write and one year to shoot in South Africa. Uh, so we're probably not going to see this until at least at the earliest 2025. But I'm betting more 2026. Mm-hmm. Which. It's sad, but also people keep in mind that depending on when the strike is over, before then, we're going to finally get to see the last season of Stranger Things and hopefully finally get to see the second season of Squid Games. And on top of that, good things are, good things come to those who wait, Mm -hmm. is the trying to say. But what I was trying to say is if we want great quality content, we got to wait for it. Yeah, I don't. You know? want, I don't want them to rush it because they took their time, put a lot of love and effort into the first season, and it came out good. So because if you want mm-hmm. something that's prop, you could easily go to any C or D tier fast food restaurant. You know. Yeah. You know, so I I'm tired of McDonald's. I sometimes maybe sometimes I want to go to the Cheesecake Factory, even though they're overpriced and expensive. Yeah, but uh, anyway, we're done with the news. All right, so we're going to jump right from the news, and let me check my watch. Yep, it is that time again. It is screen time. For those of you who are new to the podcast, screen time is a segment of the podcast where we talk about the different pieces of media we've been consuming in between podcast episodes. That can range from anything from TV shows, movies, manga, anime, video games, and more. Uh, I've got a long list of shit, so I'm going to go first, and I'm going to start with a soapbox. Here we go. 
buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, because I watched the first five episodes of Ahsoka. Or should I say more accurately, Rebels Season 5, because that's what this show is for real. Look, man, I love Star Wars. I really, really love Star Wars. So when stuff in Star Wars is meh, it hurts me even more than it being bad. And this is very, very meh. Like, like aggressive? At least like the first four were very, very meh. Like, okay, to, to explain explain my problems with it without going into spoilers, um, the pacing is really off. Everybody, mm. it's, a, it's a lot of talking, but like there's a lot of like long, awkward pauses with the talking. And like, I could see how this works in an animated setting and be more phonetic. But like in live action, this is just boring as fuck. And like, it takes a while for this shit to pick up. And also part of my major problem with the show is that they're taking a lot of mystique from the force, which I hate. It's terrible, shouldn't have been done. And I hate it. You can't change my mind about it. I hate it, absolutely hate it. Um, on the positive side, Rosario Dawson is a good Ahsoka when she's actually allowed to be Ahsoka and the show actually focuses on her. But for the most part, for the first four episodes, it's the Sabine show. And no disrespect to the actress, because it's not her fault. She's performing the best she can with the material she's given, but the material she's given is kind of shit. <laughs> and neglectful of her character development, that was presented in Rebels, which is weird to me because the guy who made Rebels made this show. So what the fuck, Dave? The and fucking team. it look, man, it it's a it's a whole it's a whole thing. Uh Hera is fantastic though. I I love Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Hera, not just because she wears very form-fitting pants, but also she wears very form-fitting pants. Hera is fantastic. I love her. I'm still waiting for her to get angry so I can hear her sexy French Twilight accent from the cartoon. But, you know, Hera's great. I'm just, I'm just sad that we don't see Zeb anywhere because we know Zeb exists. We've seen him in live action, but it's weird that we don't see Zeb. Uh, good old murderous chop is still there committing war crimes as per usual. <laughs> uh, so, you know, love seeing chop, but there are also some weird inconsistencies with Chopper in terms of like, this is going to be really nerdy, but like how droids work in the Star Wars universe has been firmly established and they do something with Chopper that doesn't make sense and like contradicts with his character. And I know what you're thinking. He's just a trash can. Ro he's just a trash can shaped robot. What do you mean? He what do you mean his character? Trust me, if you've seen Rebels, Chopper has a character all of his own, and it has very murderous intent. Chopper has the highest and body count of everyone on the Ghost crew. Like actually, like that's not even a joke. It's been counted and documented. He has the highest body count. Um, Robots to commit war crimes. Yep. Uh, no repercussions for actions. Yep. Well, I mean, to be fair, also go back to the original trilogy. Oh yeah, and R all the death. R2, yeah, R two is also psycho, which is which is why uh, the thing that they do with Chop doesn't make sense to me because technically them doing this should have stopped him from being psycho. The whole reason he's psycho is that this thing was never done to him or R two. But, oh, you know, oh, it it's just it's really fucking weird. And I hate it as someone who's a who's a lore fan, uh, you know, so uh, let me let me stop shitting on the show for a second and actually talk about the episode that kept me in here. Episode five. Holy shit. What an episode. I'm a I'm a be I'm gonna be real with y'all. Y'all have seen the trailers. Y'all have seen the clips on Twitter. I I'm pretty sure y'all know, but I'm gonna give a spoiler warning just in case. So 
skip past this if you don't want to hear about Ahsoka episode 5, but this was probably the greatest piece of Star Wars I've seen since Andor. And if you've seen Andor, that's pretty high praise. It's not as good as Andor, but like I was actually invested in this because, uh, you know, again, spoiler, the boy Hayden is back and yeah we got we got to see we got to see him in his fucking clone wars outfit in act and we got to see the scenes of actual battles that were played out in the show and they got the correct battles and the, t the, the timeline it was it was like okay dave so you actually do remember stuff you worked on so that which like made me happy but then also frustrated me because i'm like okay if you remember why are you doing this but anyways uh, it was great. Hayden Christensen has not missed a step. You can tell that he had to hold back on Ahsoka slash Rosario because that man, his blade work choreography was fucking immaculate. And it was fucking plain as day that this man was operating with kid gloves on with old snips. Like, nice. It was, um... it was great. And Kid Ahsoka was actually a pretty good actor, which I was kind of terrified of i was like mm, it's kid ahsoka child actors but no kid ahsoka actually was more ahsoka like than rosario dawson has been in like three episodes nice. i don't want to spoil it for people that hadn't seen it but i did hear that another character returned mm -hmm. it, uh, it was a, it was their first time showing up in live action it was a quick cameo but they were there okay cool yep it was awesome. It's very nostalgic. And, nice. you know, look, they they hit me with the member berries. And I'm not going to lie. Those member berries were delicious. It's not nice. a, it's not enough for me to raise the show above a five right now. But there are still Ooh. three more episodes left. If they can stick the landing, yeah. it might at least get up to a six or a seven. But, mm. you know, I don't hold hope for it to be honest you know what this kind of reminds me of the way that you're talking about this what kind of reminds me like how i felt about book of boba fett because i actually watched well, that so i ended up watching book of boba fett too i was actually going to mention that as part of my screen time as well so nice transition uh book of boba fett was pointless because it was just mando season 2.5 the way that I say it is similar to how you were saying about Ahsoka. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's because... good. It's good when they focus on the person that the show is named after. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fucking stupid, dude. They should have just called this show Rebel Season 5 and been done with it. This isn't really an Ahsoka show. This is a show about the ghost crew and Ahsoka happens to be teaming up with the ghost crew. Yeah, and Book of Boa Fett take the venture to say hey let's talk about a different mandalorian because when you talk about like crime boss boba fett and like all the stuff that led him to how he was in mando season two mm -hmm. that stuff was good yep yeah no it, it it's it's very weird because like i really like hera if the, if this show was just straight up just about hera and like the ghost crew's problems, like they clearly want it to be, I'd probably be more forgiving of this show. But nah, the show's called Ahsoka for some weird reason. <laughs> Even though Ahsoka um, was only the main character of episodes four and five. Go figure, the two episodes that were okay and good, respectively. What was it called? Um, Raiders of the Republic, the canceled show. Oh, I yeah. heard for a while there that they were going to have Hera lead that show. Dude, if it was Mary Elizabeth Winstead's Hera, I would have watched that. Even though I don't like the whole, uh, I, I hate the New Republic with a passion because they're a bunch of incompetent jackasses. That's neither here nor there. That That's for a possible Ahsoka review that I'm going to probably... Look, if, if this if this show doesn't stick the landing, I'm probably going to have to drink for it. Uh, but I'll do it. Also, to, to give more positives, uh, fucking the people carrying the show on their fucking back is Ray Stevenson, rest in peace, and his apprentice. Mm. Because they 
are the most interesting part of this entire show. Every time it cuts to them, I'm like, yay, I don't have to deal with this bullshit. Oh, God. This bullshit over here? Get rid of it. But Ray Stevenson is cool as fuck. He's not necessarily the most complex character. It's nothing groundbreaking, but he does his job and he does it well, you know? He's the best there is at what he does, and what he does isn't very nice. You know? Yeah. That's an inside well, joke because, um, you know, Ray Stevenson played Sabretooth. But here's the thing. He? Yeah, um, he was when? he was in uh he was X-Men Real Origins Wolverine Sabretooth. That was Leaf Driver. Oh, that was Leaf yeah, Driver. Leaf okay, they, they look they look very they look very similar. They do. My bad. But I will say, uh, that Ray Ray Stevens, outside of Punisher War Zone, is always plays a side character that you oddly root for. Yeah, I don't. So yeah. I I don't root for I don't root for Skull. I don't root. Well, for, I don't, you enjoy watching. Oh yeah, Skull and Hottie are the best parts of this fucking show, bar none. Uh, because. People forget that Ray Stevens was actually in the MCU. Yep. Yeah, he no. was the Volstag of the Warriors Three. Mm-hmm. Now, it, like they, they're they're fucking cool. Uh, fucking Scald has an epic hallway scene. It's no Darth Vader hallway scene, but it's a good hallway scene. Um, nice. Like, and y- you know, when I say hallway scene, y'all know what that's code for. Uh, if you've seen Rogue One. Or I guess Mando season two, right? That that was technically a hallway scene, season, I guess. Season three. Oh, it was three. Yeah, three. Um, but yeah, no. That three was the one where where like he was sharing the screen with Bo. Yep. Scald and Hati are great. Rest in peace, Ray Stevenson. I I could t- I could tell the weight of carrying this show on your back did not help with your health with your health condition. I apologize. Rest in peace. You've earned this this long deserved rest. Thank you for your service. Star Wars fans everywhere owe you a debt of gratitude for making this show actually bearable. I wish Marvel had treated you better with both of your characters. Yeah. I agree 100%. When it comes to a lot of actors just out there doing like superhero stuff in general. Mm-hmm. We don't give enough credit a lot of the time. Yeah, especially the aggressively mid ones, or like Ray Stevenson, who did the best that he could with the material that he had. He was a great Volstagg. And to be fair, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it because nobody else will say it. Kenneth Branagh's Thor is the best Thor movie because it's actually it, a Thor movie. It's not perfect, but I think I can agree. Yeah, it's aggressively mid, but I can accept that. Because it's not Dark World terrible, but it's not. It, it's that weird it, middle child. It's, look, evil it, the re- the reason why I say it's the best Thor movie is because it, like, when you look back at it, this perfectly captures the spirit of those old '60s Journey into Mystery Thor books with the whole well, Sha- Shakespearean atmosphere and. Like storytelling style, which you know Kenneth Branagh is famous for. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was, and the costume design was great. The sets were awesome. Oh, yeah. Now that 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 movie that movie deserves more, way more credit. And Cat Dennings was actually funny in the first one, which yeah. isn't a knock at Cat Dennings because Cat Dennings is funny in general. She does a great death in the Sandman audio drama. Cat uh, Dennings is really funny. But like she wasn't and, funny after the first movie. Yeah. Well, in in the if she wasn't funny in Thor two because then she came back for uh, Wandavision and she was funny in that. Oh yeah, she was funny in Wandavision. She was funny in Wandavision. Here we are rating Thor films. Rest in rest in peace. Yeah, to, moving on. Yeah, rest in peace to Ray Stevenson once again. Uh, yeah, so I watched that. Uh, I was on a real Disney Plus kick, I guess, because I also watched live action little mermaid uh with chloe bailey in it i mean it was holly oh it, oh, mean, it, oh, oh it was it was oh it was Haley. i see they're twins so i i, I never know oh. which one is i i never know which one is which i think it's supposed to be Haley or holly yeah what? no it's, it's Haley. yeah her name's Haley. yeah huh okay My, 
sometimes when you look at a name it, no, when I, it spells I, no, you. I feel you i i i go, oh, I go back and me. i go back and forth with saying holly and Haley, but uh somebody told me it was Haley, so i was like oh okay it's Haley. and uh go back to the news to see how well i do with pronunciation uh but yeah oh. live action little mermaid it's probably the most inoffensive of all the disney live action remakes it's not bad. It's not groundbreaking. It's just the movie again with real people. I well, I heard that Eric was the highlight. No. Yeah, Eric is the highlight. Because, like, when Haley isn't singing, Ariel's not as interesting. Oof. They clearly hired Haley. They clearly hired Haley because Haley has an amazing voice, and they didn't want any. They didn't want the same backlash they got from Auto Tune Watson. Um, uh. Well, at least I'll give Disney this, right? They at least attempted to actually put quality music out there and mm-hmm. not piss me. Oh, yeah. No, Live Action Little Mermaid has great numbers in it. It's like I said, it's the most inoffensive one of all the Disney live action remakes. Because, like, it's just the movie again, but, but live action and, people. Yeah. And uh, let's wait for uh, the rumored next one. Oh. Which I think is gonna, which is rumored to be uh, Tangled. No, have we it's g- not. Have we gotten that far already that Tangled is oh. old enough to get a remake? No. Oh my god! No. I man, that that just aged me a hundred years in my mind. Nah, gentlemen, the next one's supposed to be Snow White. Oh right! Oh right! That, oh no, that's gonna be a trash what? fire. But I was saying, I was saying that after that, because the rumor is that they're trying to get Florence Pugh to play. Oh, to play Rapunzel. Rapunzel. That's actually perfect casting on paper. Uh, but uh, um, here's the thing about that: Mandy Moore voice. Yeah, Rapunzel. And, Ma- and Mandy Moore is fine as fuck. Like I, uh huh. She sing. Yeah, too. yeah, she does, and she, like Why? people, people forget that she had a music career, and also like anybody familiar with the channel, because I know my This Is Us videos are one of my most popular uh, series that I covered. What did I constantly call? Um, what did I constantly call Rebecca slash Mandy Moore? I affectionately referred to her as Mandy Milf because she's hot even when she was in like grandma costuming and makeup i was like no i'd still hit that but yeah uh so live action little mermaid meh not not good not bad but you know music was great uh but you know fucking uh, alan Menken and howard ashman duh Mo- moving on the other thing i watched on disney plus was elemental the new Pixar movie that finally dropped on Disney Plus. It's a really cute movie. I like it. Fun concept. Interesting nice. world. It's cute. That's really all I have to say about it. it. It wasn't one of those Pixar movies that made me cry, surprisingly. Pixar movies Ooh. usually make me cry. But this one didn't make me cry. It was like Luca, where like I was just kind of I was just happy at the end. And it felt like, odd. oh, that felt good. It felt good in my That's soul. That's good. It felt good, but it also felt wrong to me. Like, I hear you, which, uh, by the way, uh-huh. don't think that that's going to be a regular thing because, uh, according to rumors, they're currently working on a, uh, fifth Toy Story. Nice. Uh, but, what? but in this one, in this one, it's going to feature Andy as an adult with kids of his own. Yeah, look, t- Tony, Tony, before before you before you cry foul on the Toy Story franchise, I will give the Toy Story people credit. The Toy Story people only make movies when they have something to say or some new shit has happened in their lives that they that they want to fucking play out through these animated toys. Like, you know what? Fair. I will give them that. Because the Toy Story trilogy, the original trilogy of Toy Story movies was perfect. Toy Story 4 was this deep existential crisis about, you know, what it means to be needed and your place in the world. Keanu was in it. It was awesome. Nice. The the only Pixar movie that I'm actually worried about Mm -hmm. is uh, Inside Out 2. Oh, wait, why, why are you worried and about it? Because supposedly Amy's the only one returning what? as the voices. What the hell? They didn't, they, they didn't 
didn't get fucking Lewis Black back as anger. He was the best part. Or Phyllis from The Office, whose like actual actress well, name I can't remember. Apparently, apparently they wanted to pay Amy like marginally more than everyone else, and they didn't accept it. The only yeah. way I will accept Inside Out Two is if Sadness is voiced by Tina Fey, because those two are a dynamic duo. That can get shit done. Uh, but yeah, Elemental, super cute. I liked it a lot. Didn't make me cry, but it was it was a good movie. Um, what else did I watch? Oh yeah, I've started to watch My Happy Marriage uh, in preparation for a, a later episode. Wait, really like what, it. What, what have I told you? <laughs> nah, like, look, I'm, gl I'm really glad I waited till it was over because I would not be able to handle those fucking cliffhangers. Actually, no, it's not over quite yet. It only ha no, uh, it, it only has 12 episodes for the season, though. I thought it was over. But the 12th hasn't happened yet, no, my it, guy. No, it's out, dude. No? Yeah, it won't be on. No, it came out today. No, that's it. Episode 12 comes out on the 20th. It's oh. the 19th. Oh wow! Well, I will. I won't. Well, by, by by the time by the time I'm by the time I'm there, the last episode will be there, so I don't have to worry about a cliffhanger. Yes. Yes. But yes, yeah, I really like it. Very interesting world. A lot of messy fuck shit. The 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 sub is super well voice acted. Uh, it's very pretty. Great show. Really enjoy it. Nice. Um. Awesome. Credit to uh, the dub cast too. They do an amazing job. Oh, with I materials. haven't. I haven't checked out the dub. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do that. Uh, for it's gonna be and weird mm -hmm. because I know the lead actor for other stuff. Ah, uh, I was still gonna say he's one of the Smosh people, like one of the new Smosh people. Oh, cool. The, Damian Haas. Uh, the other the uh the last the last thing that I watched was um. I've been keeping up with Futurama Weekly. I haven't really talked about it because, like, I I don't I don't really want to just talk about a new episode every week. But since we're about uh, we're pretty close to the end of part one, uh, I will say I really like this Hulu season. Uh, it's it's different, but different in the same way that the Comedy Central seasons were different from the Fox seasons. I like it. It follows up, meanwhile, very well, which I didn't know how they were going to do because meanwhile, I mean, with Futurama in general, uh, whenever they know they're getting canceled, they make their season finale also a series finale. But meanwhile was the best one I had seen so far. But how they handle uh, like continuing after that was really good. Um, uh, you know, all the characters are still in top form. There's a lot of good gags, a lot of good new jokes. It it doesn't feel like it's forced to be, uh, to you know give 2020 humor, uh. So, you know that's great. Fut Futurama has always been my my favorite Matt Groening show. I'm I'm happy that it's back and like, at full force. Oh, I also watched Disenchantment's final season, and that was really good, but also very rushed. Because you could tell Graining was more busy working on Futurama. We really wrap up a lot of plot lines real fast. There's not a lot of breathing time, but it was still good. That's good. That sometimes happens, like, uh, with, uh, also Ryan Murphy, where it's just, like, your focus is on yeah. something else. Yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Glee fan. I, I, I've dealt with this before, so, you know, it wasn't a big issue for me. But, yeah. That was good. Uh, in the world of video games, I finally, finally uh, completed Jedi Survivor, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, nice. which ha mm -hmm. like has been like a challenge and a half for me because I suck at platforming, and like sixty percent of this game is fucking platforming. It was it was rough. But I did it. I got so frustrated with the game that I was like, nah, you know what? I'm not going to stream that. I'm not going to stream this. This is going to be a me game. Because, like, I feel like if I stream this, I'm just going to leave the camera on and just keep going because I'm a stubborn asshole and I don't give up when I keep hitting a wall in games, both literally and figuratively. That was fun. I enjoyed the game a lot. 
uh cal continues to be one of my favorite star wars characters maybe because he's not connected to disney but you know it is what it is uh, it was pretty awesome uh but that's pretty much it for me so brian uh what pieces of media have you uh consumed uh in between podcast episodes oh i also watch fast x by the way on paramount you know all right hopefully the beginning of the end mm-hmm. hopefully also, I heard that there's uh, teases to multiple uh, spinoffs. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, continuing where I left off um, from last time, I did watch more of Money Heist, but I just, I don't know if it was, if I was not in the right headspace for something so dramatic. I just... I had to take a break, so I started watching other stuff mm-hmm. that was less uh, mentally taxing because stuff I won't get into mentally. Uh, but anyway, uh, they started up a n- new season of that show that I was telling you about called uh, Dirty Laundry, mm-hmm. where uh, it's one of Dropout TV's originals. Uh-huh. It's uh, where the comedians get together and like try to guess whose secret is whose. And this one was, like, one of the more chaotic ones. Uh, I will say that one of the secrets that they tried to guess was uh, who threw pretzels on a couple while they were doing the horizontal tango. <laughs> I mean, you know, it burned a lot of calories. You need to, you, need, you know, you need to keep, you know, you got to keep your energy up. He's just doing them a service. That was fun. That show's always good for... Uh, if you just need a laugh and something to turn off your brain to. I also watched, I caught up and watched the last two episodes of Critical Role, Campaign 3. It still has its issues. Not the last episode, but the episode before that. Introduced one of the best NPCs of the whole campaign that Matt openly admitted was highly, highly inspired by Miyazaki. Oh. Oh, cool. And then... The last episode, it featured a ghost ship. I'll just say that. Nice. And then um, I teased this before, but uh, like I said, mental health wasn't great. So I started watching something that I heard is kids show, but it's also good for adults if they're having like mental stagnation or something like that. I actually watched a few episodes of uh, Bluey. Bluey? On Disney+. Plus. Well, what, uh, what, it, what what's what's that one again? It's the it, cartoon dogs. <laughs> oh, the main one is a girl blue cartoon dog. It's an Australian show that got ported over to the U.S. Oh, I was like, and is insanely popular with kids. I was like, this sounds like off-brand Blue's Clues. It it's not. It's um, they're in a world kind of similar to um, Zootopia. Where everybody's an anthropomorphic animal. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, when, 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 I, when I heard when I heard the name Bluey, real quick, the first thing that jumped to my head was uh, the show Louie from FX, where Louie was a dog, and <laughs> yeah, uh, it, uh, that was pretty. because mm-hmm. breed dog that at least uh, she is a blue healer. If I'm remembering correctly, and also there was an episode that caused a lot of kerfuffles because it had to do with uh, with weight. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that that episode I've heard about, I hadn't seen it, but uh, it, it was kind of a misstep. But they tackle a lot of adult stuff. Like I hadn't seen it yet, but apparently they tackle some like really deep shit like generational trauma and like not feeling that you're enough as a parent oh because so, that's the thing. so so in kanto kind of yeah. but in eight in uh eight minute episode spurts teaching teaching kids small lessons here and there like don't take shortcuts in life and stuff like that but also interestingly enough sometimes the lesson of the episode because of course, the kids show they're all lessons. Also, I want I I want to I want to put an addendum on that. Kids, don't don't listen to the "Don't Take Shortcuts in Life" bit. Work smarter, not harder. This one was more about uh, 
don't let other people do the work for you. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of shortcut. I mean, if they're offering, who am I to well, who am I to say no? That would just be rude. But, I'm just, but I'm anyway. fucking with you. I'm fucking with you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But anyway, anyway, what I was trying to get at was well, I'm kind of in the zone here, so you threw me off. Oh man. That's that's what you but, that's, uh, that's what you get for trying to inject dynamic comedy into a podcast. Christ. My God. Oh the humanity. Anyway, some of the lessons are actually for adults. Uh huh. Like the adults that are watching the cartoon with the kids. Mm-hmm. It definitely kinda got that vibe of uh, shows that we used to watch when we were younger where adults can take a whole different level by watching it too. That, that's how I feel about the, the current Rugrats reboot because now I'm not even interested in the babies. I'm interested in the problems of Stu, Dee Dee, and the gang because they're nice. 30-somethings trying to figure out parenting. The help. Nice, but... Help, Dad, help! Yep. The last thing that I'll say about Bluey is uh, the main dog, Bluey, and her sister are both voiced by kids and not badly voiced. And they act like normal kids. Like, they don't act like adults trying to write kids. Oh, so it's a, so it's a, so like it's a, Char- so it's a Charlie Brown situation. Cool. Kind of. For a younger audience. Uh, but anyway, moving on, I did also watch... Uh, Two movies that I've been meaning to watch for a while. Okay. Uh, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Oh, nice. That was a pretty good sequel. No. Well, uh, yeah. But I'm talking about the first one with The Rock. and. Uh... Oh, oh, that was the first one? Oh, mm-hmm. I, I forget. I, I, did, I didn't know that the... it had a... I didn't know Jumanji... Like, the Jumanji reboot had a subtitle to it. Yeah, Welcome to the Jungle is the first one with Kevin Hart and... Uh, the Rock and Jack Black and Karen Gillan, and then the second one with them is called The Next Level. Ah, man, Jack Black was a fucking riot in the yeah. in, in the first movie. Jesus Christ! And also, Jack Black is- yeah. Also, this was the movie that where I discovered that nowadays Kevin Hart is only funny in movies. Now, for some reason, I don't. For, like, I don't know why. I don't find his stand-up funny anymore. But anytime he's in a movie, it's fucking hilarious. But anyway, yeah, I really liked it. Um, Nick Jonas. Yeah, no, that was a nice surprise. Surprisingly good actor. Needs to do more stuff. Look, I... Look, th- th- this, is gonna, this is gonna show you how old I am. Slash how young I am, I guess. But I always knew Nick Jonas was a good actor ever since I saw Camp Rock and Camp Rock 2, The Final Jam. Nick, jo- Nick, yeah. Jonas is, uh, Nick Jonas is hella underappreciated. Joe got way too much spotlight. Nobody cares about Joe Stark. Well, soon be former Joe Stark. Oh, they're getting divorced already? Yup. Damn. Mm. That was quick. Mm. I can... Say more off camera, but uh, also just Kevin's been underrated this whole time. Oh yeah, but Kevin, uh, but Kevin's never wanted the spotlight. Kevin's always just been cool being Kevin. Yep, yep. Which is part of the good thing about him. But uh, anyway, uh, back to Welcome to the Jungle. It also featured an actor that I've noticed is like he's everywhere, but also underrated at the same time. I believe his name is Bobby Kavanaugh. That name sounds uh, familiar. He he was the villain in Welcome to the Jungle. Oh, but he was also the stepdad in Ant Man. Yeah, yeah. He he always seems to be around in several places, but then he's given a very small role. Yeah, because the villain in Jumanji really isn't a villain. He's like he <laughs> he reminds me a lot of uh, Dave Desmalchin. Dave Dave Desmolchin is is somebody who's like who's like a who was a small character actor whose big break was being uh, Joker Thug number one who assisted uh, Ledger Joker in the uh, now iconic bank scene, and then he was then he became uh. a Bane goon in uh, Rises, and 
he was one of the he was one of the ones that helped Bane yeet those people out of the plane. Then he joined the Ant Man uh, movies as part of Scott's crew, which Scott's crew was unceremoniously just disappeared. Still mad at that. And then Polka Dot Man. Yeah, he was Polka. I forgot he was Polka Dot Man. Picture ev- he pictures everyone as his father. Uh, also, uh, by the way, David Dismulchin is championing right now to be the next Bond villain, and I say hell yes. Oh, that'd be awesome. Ooh. That would be awesome. But yeah, so that was good. And then also, about the same amount of, uh, I give it about the same amount, like numbers wise and all that, quality wise, was I also watched uh, Date Night. <laughs> uh, not Date Night. Uh, Game night. Oh, Sorry. game night. Game night. Yeah, I, I've seen game night. Game night was fun. I will say that uh, Jason Bateman kind of missed his calling as the unconventional action hero. Yeah, right. Also, Rachel McAdams, a lot funnier than people give her credit for. People forget she was in Mean Girls, bro. She was funny as hell Regina in Mean George. Girls. She was funny as hell in Mean Girls. That, that fucking... Delivery when she gets hit by the karma bus. Oh man! Uh, mm-hmm. uh, also, with a uh, game night, gotta give a shout out to uh, Jesse Plemons, our main man Alan from the uh, oh forgotten yeah. episode about oh, yeah. love and fun, uh, love and death, love and death. Yeah. The the boy Alan, everybody's favorite goober. Yeah. He, he was in this. He was in this as like a goober cop. He just he just has a goober face, all right. He can't mm-hmm. not play a goober because he has a very goober face, just like Matt Smith and... can't play a uh, a character that's not a weirdo because he just has weirdo face. Yeah, I'd say people who have those kinds of faces in real life, but yeah. w- when you have that kind of face. Unfortunately, you're going to get typecast for certain roles. It's when also you're an actor. it's also well, very unsettling that Matt Smith doesn't have eyebrows, which makes it makes him look kind of like a caveman because his forehead is pretty big. But uh, uh, anyway, just as to end what I was saying, both those movies were good but not perfect. Fun and had great elements to it, but maybe a little lackluster overall. I do want to see the next level. But it's going to be a little bit harder to see it. I'll just say that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that's it for me for screen time. Okay. Tony, what about you, man? What well, pieces of media have you I, consumed in between podcast episodes? I did something something very interesting, actually. Okay. First thing I want to mention is that I listened to some music. Nice. It's YouTube-related music. Okay. So I decided... Recently, actually, I wanted to just listen to some good, uh, good nerdcore rap stuff. Uh-huh. And I went back to not like Joshua's uh, JoJo ciphers. Oh, cool. Like, uh, I listened to the villain rap first, where it's all eight parts, because we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Part mean villain, because it just started. Mm-hmm. Still quality stuff. The people that he got to do the rap verses for these villains. Yeah, I want to say Rusted was in that one. Uh, Rusted also does really good uh, nerdcore rap on YouTube. Rusted does uh, part 3D. Yep. And uh, so I listened to that. I listened to the Joe one. Mm-hmm. Like, multiple. Because I think out of, my, out of the JoJo group raps... The Joe Bro one is my favorite because musically, like the uh, the accompaniment was perfect, oh, cool. immaculate, uh, beautiful. To to uh, give you a suggestion of something to listen to, uh, Rustage actually did a uh, a Josuke song called uh, Diamond. The hook is so good. Oh man, it it, it really it really captures Josuke as a character. And but uh, here's the, the witty references are always nice. Rustage is great with punchlines. Here's the coolest thing uh, about that. Someone actually made an edit of the JoJo main villain and their respective Joe star from their respective part. Mm -hmm. Sure, the flow is a bit janky because it's the JoJo villain and then their respective Joe star or Mm -hmm. JoJo. And 
the ciphers for both are kind of funky. Like the yeah, because the beat's different. So like the so the flow is going to be off. But for some of them, it actually flowed in pretty damn well. Oh, nice. Not gonna lie, is a seven minute long bit of content, but it is fantastic. Nice. In my opinion. One thing I will definitely say is when you have just all these talented individuals, because they got a Joey, formerly known as the Anime Man, yeah, doing Jorna. Yeah, I, I I remember him talking about this on the Trash Date episode. And of course, uh, Connor, aka uh, C Dog, yep. he does part. Uh, he does part three Jotaro. That makes sense. He's got he's got he's got the he's got the uh, range for that. He also does uh, Kira's. I would for... say he has to do Kira. He looks like he Kira. He did, and it was hilarious because he really went off on a lot of the Kira isms. Nice, like the fact that uh, for those of you who don't know, Yoshikage Kira is the main villain of Part Four of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Uh, Diamond is unbreakable. And it's unbreakable. And he is a serial killer who has a fascination with women's hands. Yeah, he has a hand because... fetish. Yes, he has a hand. I put it a bit more eloquently, but yes, it is a hand fetish. He... Man, man nuts over hands because he saw the Mona Lisa one time. It ain't called. It ain't called JoJo's average adventure. All right. When you have uh, stands, vampires, and hormones, or in the alternate universe, Ripple. Since part the spin, the ripple, yeah, and then you have rock humans. It it, it it's a weird, complicated place, it, it's, but it, it's, it's 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 the most anime anime that ever was to anime. But it's a fun time. Oh Just yeah. looking at the show is fun, ridiculous fun. You know what was my favorite verse in the Joe Bro cipher? Because there was actually a lot that I loved okay. about that cipher. It starts. Very good with Speedwagon. Oh, best girl Speedwagon. That flow just hit, hit, hit. And then it goes into Caesars. Uh, and that was rusty. Nice. Caesar! And, and he went hard on that. <laughs> he went hard. Man. Because one of the my favorite lines from uh, his uh, verse, he went into uh, Caesars' final rebuttal. And then go straight into Japanese to uh, kind of make that oh, flow. Oh, that's cool. I mean, Rustich did that with his uh, verse as part three Dio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to but check this one out. Emotion with Caesar, but the flow that I loved the most. It's actually a tie between Okayasu. Uh huh. Loved like the upbeat flow because fun yeah. fact, folks. And those who are other fellow JoJo fans, Okiyasu is my favorite show, bro. Oh, because I love him. He's he's un- he's underrated as fuck. Yeah, I think I've mentioned this before. Okiyasu is my favorite show, bro, because he's a goofy, lovable idiot. Yeah, and Bad Company is a good stand. No, his company is the hand. Oh, right, right, right. No, his brother is the one with Bad Company, isn't it? Yeah, that's. Uh... Yep, I I I always I always mix those up. But yeah, okay, okay, yeah, is cool. I think my favorite Joe Bro is Kakuin. Yeah, and his is actually a pretty decent flow too. Not my favorite, but serviceable. Nice. Uh, what, but what, was uh, was, was Guile included in that? I mean, Jean Pierre bon, Polnara. Which... Nope, it was just uh, Kakuin. Uh, which fun fact for y'all? If you did not know, uh. Street fight, uh, Street fight. Uh, the creator of Street Fighter is a massive JoJo fan, and Part Three was out at the time the first Street Fighter game came out, and Guile is just straight up Jean Pierre Polnareff. Like the creator has straight up said, if you look at Guile, you and you know what Polnareff looks like. Yeah, it's the same thing, except Polnareff has silver hair, Guile is blonde. Only difference. But- but you know what verse I think you might like, Jay? Because I highly recommend that you actually listen to it. Okay. I think you might like uh, Bucciarati's. Because oh. the flow of that one is pretty damn good. Man, Bruno. I love Bruno. We can talk about Bruno. And I love at the tail end of uh, his verse, 
he goes to this fast flow because you know uh sticky finger stan cry is avi 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 yeah. mm-hmm. and bruno goes to uh arriva yeah it, he does that flow it's oh, amazing shit. i look i i always like triple time i can i can i can do it occasionally with enough practice and enough air in my lungs and since i know you are a connoisseur when it comes to hip-hop mm-hmm. you would know the various different styles a lot better than i would oh yeah for, for sure me, just love musical flow that's mm-hmm. just it mm-hmm. and the one that tied with okiyasu as one of my favorite verses in the joe bro rap is Hermes's. Ooh, nice. Hermes is Hermes was a Hermes was a solid character. Oh, side oh, note. I want to know how was Jolene's verse in the Joe Star one? Uh they got Chi Chi, uh, a pretty famous uh music related uh YouTuber. Uh-huh. To do part. Mm-hmm. It has a majestic flow to her, nice. but it doesn't give uh Jolene's personality uh... of like it it, it doesn't it, do, it doesn't it, ha- it doesn't have like a punk kind of like feel to it. No, it doesn't. Just Jolene's uh flow didn't feel punkish enough. It's nothing against uh, Chi Chi. It's mm. just because I heard her do some kind of pop punk kind of rap style. Mm-hmm. It just it felt off. Ah, uh... which the first time that I heard her attempt it, mm-hmm. it that wouldn't feel right either. But so gotcha. it's kind of this. I mean, program. there, and that's weird to me because there are a lot of like, especially recently, there are a lot of like really hard n- nerdcore female rappers, like on YouTube. I mean, shit, like who I would have picked for Jolene is Demon Dice. Here's the best part because they end off with part eight. The best part is that they got Caleb Hayes to do all of part eight. Oh, nice. So he does Part 8 Josuke, which the man's singing voice is amazing. Cool. And uh, his flow with Josuke's is so immaculate, is gorgeous. Interesting. So, uh, question, did did he do something cool, like mix the style of Josuke and Jotaro? So like, so to construct Yappy's flow? Mm -hmm. Since, uh, made before part eight's ending uh-huh. uh, for the uh, for the main jojo mm-hmm. rap mm-hmm. part eight wasn't finished yet mm-hmm. so a lot of things that they added but just caleb's flow is great nice the toughest thing and he admitted in a comment underneath the uh, video that they did the do re mi fa so lati do and it was the hardest part for him to actually get right ah uh, yeah because of the flow shift mm-hmm I can I, I could I can see that being difficult. But one of my favorite things about his part eight raps is his Taurus. Oh nice. Oh my god. So good. It was creepy. It was kind of a stalkerish feel. Now nah, it makes sense for Taurus. Yeah, very it fits the part eight main villain, but it also feels so calm, so collected. Yeah, because Taurus was very methodical. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The first line is, didn't know I was the villain. It was Kono Toruda. Oh, that's, that, 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 that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good bar. That's a good bar. And he mentions a lot of flows in Calamity. Mm-hmm. It is verse because of Sin, Wonder Review, yeah. which is a stand that basically causes Calamity. Yep. In simple terms, because I'm not going to get into what the fuck wonder if you does because that will take all damn day and we don't have time for that shit yeah because vill- like villain stands get more and more complicated as we enter uh, especially when we switch over to the uh steel ball run universe dirty deeds done dirt cheap is um is a lot um, to explain you know oh yeah all, all that shit and not like joshua also does all of the part eight you know part seven characters oh cool that's my favorite that's my favorite uh alternate universe uh part so far all right so but by far like the most like gorgeous musically i would say other than like gappies that caleb did was his joshu uh jobro rap nice which i was surprised it was or joshu and not momozuka but yeah. hey 
It is. I, it is. Yeah, I was going to say, mobile, and mobile Super Call would have been perfect because you could have did like a Snoop Dogg impression. And yeah, you... but, but it is. Musically, it was really good, and it really spoke to Joshu's simp character. Yeah, yeah. Because, okay, so, fun fact about all of, uh, at least the two main villain and the Jobro for the Part 8 characters. Mm -hmm. They both mention uh, Yasuo. Uh, of course. Of course, they were both Thurston. And then, uh, I, like, have a favorite part in, uh, Gyros. Nice. Because not like Gyro's flow is really good. I mean, Gyro, I mean, if we're if we're counting like uh alternate universe Joe Bros, Gyro might be my favorite Joe Bro. It would make sense because he's kind of the perfect in relative terms, the perfect Zapelli yeah. in Iraqi. Hundred percent. Makes sense. He's perfected but, Caesar. Mm-hmm. And one of the funniest things about that, right? There's a little bit of a Rihanna reference. Because you know how in uh, the song Umbrella, there's that Ella, Ella, Ella? Uh-huh. He did that, uh, making a cheese pun. Oh, nice. So Now that makes sense. It, it involves mozzarella. It's just great. It was just this perfect thing. <laughs> Sweet. Sorry, sorry we're nerding out, folks. But, like, jo jo JoJo's, like, a, a big thing. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta, sh I gotta show you some of the the fate ones I've found in terms of like nerdcore stuff. There's, there's some really good oh, shit. Nice. Also, uh, just, I just want to bring up real quick, quick side note. Speaking about music, and uh, you were talking about a uh, female pop punk. Mm -hmm. That reminded me that I forgot to mention this a while back. But uh, Cassie Pope has a new song where she's gone back to a uh, pop rock. Nice. Nice. She oh. dropped out of her country stuff. Did you? Uh, uh, she teamed up with mm -hmm. another chick named Taylor Acorn. Did you end up uh, awesome listening to album. the? Uh, did you end up listening to the Olivia Rodrigo album yet, Brian? Like I, uh, I know. I was I, commenting I on it when you were okay. I, I I listened to like half of it. Okay. Cause like I now I remember you were commenting on it, but like I I know you said you had said you didn't finish it, so I was wondering if you had finished it. Oh no, but I agree with mostly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, also, uh, I will say, Jay, mm -hmm. Rustage started off the JoJo rap nice. as Jonathan. <gasps> Yo, Jonathan, Jonathan is part two. Jonathan is probably like he's tied with Jotaro for me as my favorite Joe star. Jonathan is part one. Oh, oh you're wait. thinking. Oh, I'm thinking Joseph. Yeah, I'm thinking Joseph. Yeah, jo John. Jo yeah, jo Jonathan was Phantom Blood. My bad. Yeah, Nux actually did. Uh, Jonathan uh, did Joseph's. Oh, cool. Good. Nice. I I think even though Jonathan, no, no, Joseph. Now I'm doing it. Yeah, see, see, you got me doing it. God damn. It's because it's because he was raised by Susie Q, or not Susie Q. Yeah, no. No, Suzy, no, no was, Suzy uh, Q was Joseph's wife. I'm doing it again. I'm confusing Jonathan and fucking Joseph. God damn it! This is this, okay. this has to be how Point my being. this has to be how my grandparents feel about all the J names. I get it now. Point being, Joseph Joser is my favorite JoJo because he is not only kind-hearted at times, but just a quick-thinking, trash-talking, smooth-talking. Swashbuckler kind of character. Yeah, I love Joseph. Jo character. Joseph Joestar is the Han Solo of the JoJo universe. Like... Oh hell yeah, one hundred percent, and he is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But no, he does good. But part of it's kind of it's Nux's voice. I was just about to say I I can't picture his voice because of you know, uh, and no offense to Nux, I love his content, but like yeah, his voice Nux is, is great. His voice is too high pitched for joseph yeah but he does mention uh hermit purple nice which is cool but when you have to like go after rustage that's a bit yeah, of a that's a tough act to follow that's definitely a tough yeah. act to follow Ru Ru rustage but, is uh rustage is pretty goaded but back to uh the joe bro rap i loved just musically the flow and the talented uh lady that they got to do Hermes. Mm -hmm. 
phenomenal. Nice. Her flow was great. Her character-related puns and references were fantastic. It's all. It's always good when they put care into like the uh, female characters they include in these ciphers because that was one of my big complaints with some of the uh, like poke girl ciphers that uh, have been put out is that like you can t like some some of the girls like clearly outshine some of the others and it was just like man I mean gr yeah. granted like the ones who outshine the others are the better poke girls like your Cynthia Cynthia <laughs> I don't remember who it was, but Cynthia in one of those was fucking crazy. Oh, here's something really ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. I think I showed one of uh, Cam Steady's uh, Pokemon-related ciphers. It was mm -hmm. Rivals. Yeah. I remember this very yeah. well yeah. because Chi-Chi did the one of the friend trio from uh, X and Y. Oh, was, was, the, it, was it Shauna? Was it Shauna? No. Yeah, Shauna. Mm -hmm. The young... Young lady. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I figured it wasn't Serena, so it had to be Shauna. Yeah, because they did Serena as the protagonist for XY. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was her voice, and that's why I just didn't like the pop punk aesthetic when it come when it came to her flow. Yeah. For look, that's why that's why it, I'm saying you know demon dice would have been perfect for it because like you know anybody who is a uh, like an avid Hollow Live fan knows that well not that Demon Dice and Cali are the same person, obviously not, but like yeah, you definitely know, not, no. You know, their their flows are very, very similar and like I think she would have been perfect for Jolene because she has that aggressive attitude but still can be very cute on the inside, which is exactly what Jolene is. She's super hard and aggressive, but she's actually like really cutesy on the inside and it's adorable. But speaking of uh, VTubers doing anime ciphers, mm -hmm. Mousy actually did one. Oh shit, really? Yeah, she, uh, when it came to women of anime, uh -huh. what a good cipher that I highly recommend. All right, you definitely uh, have to link me that one. I'm curious. Ethico, actually. Oh, no, that makes sense. Tiny, tiny character for tiny voice. And the selection of characters that they got for this uh, cipher. Nami was uh, one piece representation. Nice, nice. Was Saber in this? Nope. No Saber? Uh -huh. uh, no Saber. Uh, if I recall, it was uh, Uraka okay. from uh, My Hero. Okay. Ochako, uh, not expected. Mikasa from uh, AOT. Attack on Time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fire Witch from uh, Fire Force. I think uh, her name's Maki. Oh, the muscle. Yeah, yeah, fire... Ma yeah, muscle waifu Maki. Yeah, fucking best yeah. girl. I, I'm glad. Mm -hmm. it, I'm glad it wasn't just a fan service cat bitch. Because I don't. Nah. I, I don't like fan service cat mm -hmm. bitch. Oh, and to end that cipher, because a lot of the others were mm. pretty damn, but Chi Chi brings it home as Sailor Moon herself. Oh, nice! It was great. Well, nice. I'm just recommending it. Nice. But in terms of, and another cipher that I want you to check out, Jay, because I think you would really appreciate it, mm -hmm. is uh, not like Joshua did a rap dedicated to the Forgers from Spec Family. Oh, cool. With his wife and his, and their kid. Aww. And little girl has bars. Nice, nice. I actually really want to play that uh, spy family game uh, that uh, is gonna, is coming out. Uh, yeah, soon. that that looks like fun. That looks adorable. Yeah, but... I, I also found out it has a PC <laughs> port, so I could I could actually stream that. One. Something that's tangentially related. Mm -hmm. I finished the first part of. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's DLC, The Hidden Treasure of Area Zero, The Teal Mask. It was a fun experience. Yeah, for you, this first you you DLC. you filled me up, uh, you filled me in on some of it off camera. I, nice. Like you can you convinced me to eventually get the DLC this time around because yep. it actually and, seems worth it. 
And here's uh, some things that I forgot to mention to you, Jay, because mm-hmm. I had to sleep. <laughs> but there's no disconnect in the, the two parts of the DLC. There are parts for a reason, because they tell a semi-continuous story with character progression. Oh, that's cool! Because uh, the characters we meet in the Teal Mask, Carmine and Kieran, are at Blueberry Academy. Cool. So they go to that school, and we get to continue on with their character progression, hmm. which I still say, and uh, a lot of people in the Pokemon community who've actually played Teal Mask, like some of the notable Poke, uh tubers like TV. He has done a and just finished up his playthrough of the Teal Mask, actually. Nice. I, oh, today. I, I like I like Mikey. My, my, Mikey's Mikey's cool. Yep, and his uh reactions to uh Carmine's personality, mm-hmm. he he's like, damn girl, you need to calm down. Yeah, look, I, I've seen I've seen a lot of fan comics on Twitter that she's like the super sundere. Oh no 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 no, Jay. From what you're looking, that's not even the half of it. Mm-hmm. This girl, since you guys have, I know for a fact, have played base, Scarlet, and Violet. Yeah. I can actually make a comparison. Mm-hmm. She's like Nimona in terms of characterization, focused on the battle. Okay. Whereas Nimona... That's a large order. Nimona is focused on, like, battling to be stronger and basically your Goku, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, go teenage girl. Yep. Carmine is teenage Vegeta. Ah. Uh, inter- so, so there's got it. So you say teenage Vegeta. So does that mean that there's like a crazy amount of hubris? Because you de- you can't have Vegeta without massive hubris. When you compare your beauty to that of a legendary Pokemon. Yep. Oh, that's no, no that, 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 that checks out. That checks out. And also, in terms of her characterization, the way that she treats her brother is uh, pretty toxic, actually. Yeah. No, I've heard I've heard bits and pieces. And from what I've told you, you kind of get a bit more of that picture, too, right? Yeah. And also, I've seen some very disturbing art online, and you people should be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah. Uh, uh, but... I gotta say, this DLC blew out, completely annihilated Sword and Shield's DLC out of the water. That's good to hear, because I was pissed off that I spent 30 bucks on nothing. Yeah, it... Okay, I can forgive a little bit. Not a little, but just like 1%. The, the, 1%. The, the mustard, the parts with mustard and Urshifu were awesome, but there was nothing after that. Yeah, so best way I can explain this in terms of story and characterization, mm-hmm. it's like on the level of base Scarlet and Violet because they really gave a damn with telling a compelling narrative. Oh yeah, th- that's probably the strongest part of Scarlet and Violet. Like, it's it's not your usual Pokemon game where you just kind of mash A through the dialogue. You actually care about all the plot lines going on. Yeah, yeah, and they're going to do the same thing with Indigo Disc, even though that's the more battle-focused mm-hmm. part of the DLC, because it adds more returning Pokemon, including the new ones that we'll be getting in the DLC, which is perfectly acceptable. But mm-hmm. they're going to continue story progressions because both parts of the DLC are essentially one story, the hidden treasure of Area Zero. Nice. I mean, I so, have to I have to give a special shout out to fucking Violet for um actually making me good at math. I'm so I have repeatedly said like on camera and off that I am math tarded. However, if you put math in the form of Pokemon battle stats, I can math. I fucking ace that class. The only class, the only class I did not ace was the fucking language class because I couldn't, couldn't fucking communicate with that goddamn Pikachu and its tricky expressions. Yeah, apparently I was able to like do really well with all of the different courses. Yeah, except for a few questions I got wrong, but hey, it is. Now, what it the, is. Te- the teacher sub stories were really good. I was expecting them to just kind of be boring, 
a boring little side quest, but like they were really interesting. Like especially like Nurse Miriam's. Nurse Miriam is probably my favorite. Yeah, Miriam is great. Yeah. But back to Teal Masks, though. It's got to be one of my favorite little stories in terms of uh, all in all of Pokemon when it concerns a legendary. Cool. Box legendary. So, so it's, it's this is technically DLC. So like, is it so is it on par with? Personally, I think like some of the best post game stuff was Fire Red's post game, where you uh, where you you know get to explore Johto and do that whole thing. No, when, with Fire Red, you go to the Sevi Island. Oh yeah, Sevi Island. Yeah, the Sevi Island but, stuff was really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is actually. If you want to think of it, it's like post game content because. Mm-hmm. Steel Mask, you can actually start it as soon as you start your treasure hunt. Mm-hmm. In Scarlet and Violet, when people kind of restart it, it yeah. scales to match with what your current level would be. Cool. So, like I mentioned to you, and just to give Brian that bit of information if he's interested in purchasing it. So, one thing I can say, if I want to compare it to anything in terms of like an actual story, I would say think of it as a the Selby uh, side quest that we didn't get in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Oh man! I can do a fusion dance with the Isle of Armor. Okay. In terms of like new locations, actual, new Pokemon, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like adding returning Pokemon and what's up and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So combine the legendary Pokemon, well, mythical, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Combining that level of storytelling with a DLC model, mm-hmm. like Isle of Armor, fusing them together to create the Teal Mask. Yeah, which I has mean, look, the Teal Mask the... already earned major points for me when I looked at Poke Twitter and I saw Perrin. And Perrin's quest, even though, yes, it is a bit egregious to do so, but with the thing you get at the end of that quest, it is worth getting 150 Pokemon in the Kitakami Pokedex. Listen, which you can eat. Listen, to, listen, kids. Because all you gotta fun, do is have friends. Just have friends. Not only have friends, but also you. If you caught a lot of Mon in Base Paldea, it would be in the Kitakami Pokedex too. Yep. Or so you're, fun. you know, even if even if you're like me and you only catch for your battle team, that's when you just have friends. Now I have to do something really damn stupid because. Uh, DLC can make it really easy to uh, fill out and get your an actual like dex completed uh, certificate. Oh, cool! And you get the shiny charm. You can get the shiny charm with uh, the base one. I haven't done that yet because I still need the violet paradox oh. Pokemon. Oh, right, which right. I do not have. My bad. My bad. My bad. It's all good, homie. You. Are- busy with other stuff so yep. yeah i I, I'm not mad. I, I haven't i haven't touched violet since i beat it even though like i really should be exploring area zero so it's all good mm-hmm. but now you can get a fun excuse to actually play through the teal mask when you actually get it sometime in the holiday season when yep. the indigo disc would be coming out yep yep that's the plan you would have the pleasure of actually playing through a more completed story when I would have to sit on my ass waiting for the second half to actually come out. That's why I decided to wait instead of just buying it at the beginning of the month like I was originally planning to do. But yeah, no, that that's awesome though. I'm I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad that the Pokemon Company is learning from their mistakes and innovating, which you and, know innovation and the Pokemon Company hasn't been a thing for a while now. And sure. You get something really stupid like the selfie stick. It's it's stupid, but I like it because you could take fun pictures with it. Mm-hmm. Also, fun fact that you need to know because right. a lot of other people have been doing it. Okay, when people have been shiny hunting mm-hmm. for Applin, mm-hmm. because new Pokemon that it evolves into Diplin in Kitakami has this cool caramel gold color. And it's shiny. Oh, gold shinies. Those are some of my favorites. The black ones oh, no, and the no. gold ones are always some of my favorites. It's better. It gets better, my friends. Okay. You want to why? Why? When it eats its signature move, Syrup Bomb, mm-hmm. its attack matches its color. Oh, that's awesome. They finally changed attack color. Oh, that's dope. I'm going to have to well, shiny hunt this motherfucker. And since it's uh, technically covered in a syrup, 
it makes sense for it to just when the attack when it's shiny it's flavor mm -hmm. flavored syrup color mm -hmm. mikey actually used it in his playthrough and he just like oh oh cool i i will tell you this the reintroduced pokemon that we're getting in the teal mask their dex entries are kind of bare bones but perfectly serviceable yeah gone are the, gone are the days where dex entries were written by children oh but the funny like they still inject a little bit of funny and kind of stupid stuff like uh it's like bits and pieces of old dex entries with maybe something new tacked on mm -hmm. like uh when you see and with the terrasso mechanic people finally get to see chandelure with the fire terror type on its head finally is hilarious well, I mean, that's, also, that, that shit was based basically based on Chandelure. Yeah, and also, for the folks at home, that if you're still not convinced, you will feel for Ogre Pond as the main box legendary for this DLC. You will feel for the little creature like you will feel for your respective Rhydon. When I say Rhydon, I mean whole Rhydon or Miraidon. To clarify, because, you know, Rhydon is a Pokemon. <laughs> But yeah, that, no, that's awesome. I'm like I said, I'm really looking forward to 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 getting that DLC around the holidays. Um, lastly, because I forgot to mention this, and you reminded me when uh, you brought up YouTube stuff, I went down a pretty big uh, YouTube rabbit hole. I discovered the channel of this impressionist comedian that uh, that's uh, named uh, Charlie Hopkins uh, Hopkinson, mm. and uh, he has this series called uh, Obi Wan Reacts. And so what he does, right, is he deep fakes Ewan McGregor's face, Liam Neeson's face, and Hayden Christensen's face onto himself. And he does impressions of Ewan, Liam, and Hayden. And they all, like, talk about the piece of Star Wars media and, like, you know, crack jokes and talk shit. And like, it's a, it's a funny running gag because like the Anakin for this show was grown in a back to tank from Anakin's severed hands, the Dooku cut off. So this yeah. Anakin does not remember anything after episode three. So oh, that's funny. So like, you know, whenever Luke shows up, he's like, huh, he's got the same last name as me. Is he like a cousin of mine or something? And Obi Wan, huh. and Obi Wan's just like, "Don't worry, all will be clear." And like, it it, it has some it has some really funny jokes. Like they react to the Mandalorian, nice. and Obi Wan is a staunch Mandalorian racist. Oh, <laughs> it's it's yeah. fucking hilarious. He constantly refers to Grogu as the traitor, and <laughs> and also oh. the the nickname they gave to Grogu is uh Gro Grogu because. They said that the name Grogu sounds like a probiotic yogurt. <laughs> uh, I think I might have seen clips of. Uh, oh yeah, one that he did with uh, where uh, he was watching a prequel trilogy with a uh, Padme. Oh, the Attack of the Clones episode! I showed that one to Dar uh, to Darth uh, before I uh, came into the call. That's one of my favorites because, like, it's the it's their longest episode. Usually, their episodes are like maybe thirty minutes max, but this one is like a whole like hour and a half long, and they spend a good chunk of it roasting the fuck out of Anakin during all the cringy Naboo scenes. <laughs> It's so fucking, it's so fucking good. And Padme is just fucking, like, trying to purposely piss Anakin off. She says that she's on a, mm -hmm. uh, she's going on a, she's going on a ghost date with Ghost Mace Windu. <laughs> uh, and she's like, well, you know, I needed a change, Annie. I needed a real master. And I'm just like, oh, wow. oh, oh, oh. And, uh. She's not safe either, because it's like, so you made that jump. Oh, yeah. But you're not force sensitive. It's like, are, are you for, you're not force sensitive, are you? Nope. And you dropped, what was that, 30 meters? Yep. Uh, what, what, they did, what they didn't tell you is that I was, after that, I was in a pelvic cast for like eight months. Oh, my. 
and then he's like watch play it back and then you, uh, they do an edit where she drops onto the fucking onto the beach and she's like oh motherfucker that's that's gonna be a sore one uh it's it, it, it's fucking great like if you if you love if you love Star Wars and you love making fun of Disney Star Wars, you gotta watch Charlie Hapkinson. Cause like, man, <laughs> racist Obi-Wan and then reacting like, oh, sh bo -Katan, Kreese, oh shit, no. And then qui -Gon's like, what's wrong, Obi? No, Kwai, it's her sister. Oh, you mean, yeah. And then uh, one of my, one of my favorite things during the the Clone Wars episode is like oh yeah and Anakin's like oh yeah Obi oh yeah Master well wait till we wait till we make Master Qui Gon watch the Clone Wars and see how uh, let's see how you fare it's like well we're not watching it because this is my show and I get to dictate what we watch and what we don't watch not that I did anything cringy or super cutesy in my relationship not that I had a relationship. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's so fucking funny. Obi-Wan, uh, yeah. Obi-Wan refuses to wear pants. It, it's hilarious. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Qui-Gon Jinn is a fucking murderous psycho. They have a lot of fun running, uh, running gags. Like, Anakin calls, uh, Qui-Gon Jinn his grandmaster. Because, you know, Obi-Wan was his master and Qui-Gon was his. So he called, he, he constantly calls, uh, Qui-Gon his grandmaster, which which is funny. And like Qui-Gon plays like the grandparent role. He's super nice to Anakin while Obi-Wan is just always fucking mean to him. And uh the uh, the other running gag is that Obi-Wan constantly drugs clone Anakin's ham so that he uh, he so he stays like loopy and sedated the whole time, so that he can suppress his dark side impulses. And like the funniest running gag is that Qui Gon doesn't. They haven't gotten to the uh, like the end of the prequel trilogy yet, so Qui Gon has no idea that Anakin is Darth Vader. So whenever Anakin has outburst about the Empire, he's like, "Your Empire," because Qui Gon is staunchly against evil people. He's like, "I hate evil people." I'd never get along with them, and I could never ever be friends with them. And Anakin just like, no, oh, uh, uh, okay, oh man. And then the, my favorite part of the the Clone Wars episode was when uh they have that scene where Obi Wan goes into the classroom with the younglings, and as soon as the younglings come on screen, fucking Anakin is seething. He's just like, ah, ah, this fucking. Ah, the fucking kid. And then Qui Gon's like, "Is he all right?" And then Obi's just like, "No, nope, give it time. Give it time. Just eat your ham." Yep. No, he he literally tosses Anakin uh, a piece of ham. He's like, "Ooh, yay! Thank you, Master. I'm always more calm when I have my ham." <laughs> like it's 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 really funny. Granted, the Anakin the Anakin gag gets old pretty fast if you watch all the stuff like back to back like I did, but it's still funny. Like especially no. especially that like their reactions to Ahsoka are what got what convinced me to watch Ahsoka and like you know I I already spoke on that in length, but yeah no it was really fun. If you're a Star Wars fan, definitely check out Charlie Hap uh, Hopkinson. He's hilarious. Good shit. And he does a, a fantastic Morgan Freeman impression that I did not expect from a British guy. Yeah, it's crazy. It just reminded me of a small rabbit hole I went to probably a couple of months ago because it was Yu-Gi-Oh! related. And it was something similar. Mm -hmm. where, like celebrities and characters had duels in a tournament. Nice. Like uh, one that I saw. Mm -hmm. Well, one that I saw the thumbnail for, which I I need to watch because it's out of morbid curiosity. Because I I want to know mm -hmm. what kind of these individuals be rolling with. Okay, Ben Shapiro versus Ultron. Well, obviously Ultron has to run like Cyber Dragons or some kind of machine deck. I could also see Ultron yeah. running like ABCs, but Ben Shapiro yeah. has to run something very dry because apparently he likes dry pussy. Uh. But I think it is about time for us to actually get to something that was also quite funny. Yep. But before that, we gotta we yeah. gotta jump to trailer talk.
Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Trailers. Um, Sorry, bro. All good. For those of you who are unaware, Trailer Talk is the second of the podcast where Brian has curated a playlist for us of new trailers. And uh, you can find that playlist linked in the description down below. Uh, so you can react to the trailers along with us because through the magic of editing, we'll take a short intermission and then come back with our thoughts on the trailers. So Brian, tell the folks at home what we will be reacting to tonight. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a weird little selection here, but I think it's going to be cool to avoid another um, the bad the craven. Yep. To avoid another craven situation. Good. I put the possibly problem trailer first. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we finally got a trailer for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Oh. 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 I mean, I so, thought, but I look. I like Brokul Man. I just don't. I just don't like that that the, the shitter is still in the movie. Yeah. Time will tell about the trailer and the movie itself. I mean, mm. this one is just this one is a non-connected throwaway anyway. So like. You yeah, know. but uh, next up, we got a weird one that I had no idea coming, but uh, I'm excited. It's a Prime original movie called Totally Killer. It is about a 17-year-old girl who gets shunted back into time and has to team up with her teenage mom to stop a serial killer. Oh. That's I, boss as fuck. I, ho I hope it has, like, the same energy as fucking... What the fuck was that movie? With Freaky? There you go, Freaky. The one with Vince Vaughn and fucking... Yeah. yeah. Which, speaking of casting, I will never get her name right. Right, I'm sorry about this, but uh, it stars uh, the girl who played Sabrina in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Fuck, I don't even... I don't remember her name. Anyway, it stars her playing... Her mom in modern day is the mom from Modern Family. Nice. Claire. Nice. Okay. And playing the teenage version of her mom, Olivia Holt. Oh, cool. Ooh. And Man. she was a good she was a good dagger. Yes, she was. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we're going even weirder because we're hoping hopping over to uh the studio of weird, A24. Nice. Okay. Not just A24. But A24 teaming up with Nicolas Cage. Hell yeah. Okay. What kind of weird, artsy, insane bullshit are we going to get? That's, see, that that has me intrigued. It's called Dream Scenario. And if I can get the plot right, basically Nicolas Cage plays an average Joe Blow who one day randomly enters like a hundred to people's dreams. And then it takes a nightmarish turn. Ah, I see what you did there. So that'll be interesting. All right. I just saw A24, Nicolas Cage, check. Oh, yeah. We have to react to this. For sure. Okay. For sure. Uh, apologies for, like, the long-winded screen time episode, or uh, screen time segment. But, like, there was, a, there, was a, there was a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about. Me and Tony got into a fan rant. Hopefully you guys still enjoyed that, but we will be back after a short intermission to give you our thoughts on these trailers. Until then, uh, here's a word from our non-existent sponsors. And we're back. All right, so we got another uh, set of good trailers uh, this time around. Good job, Brian. Thanks. And uh, one of them was so good that we, when we saw the date, we were like, all right, Brian, fuck whatever, whatever's on the list at that date. We're doing this. We're doing this. Calling an audible. Yep. And uh, that one, we're going to start with talking about that one. Uh, totally killer. Dude, I mm -hmm. love horror camp. Not enough horror camp is done today. Now, don't get me wrong. I appreciate pure horror, right? Like, I'm, I'm a horror fan in general. But, like, mm -hmm. horror camp is some of the best shit, which... By the way, I'm I am very interested in uh the uh what is it the ex what is that what's the subtitle for the new Exorcist Rebirth? I'm actually really interested in the Exorcist Rebirth uh because it's actually it you know it actually has the uh the uh it's the last script that the author was involved in before he passed. Definitely intrigued, but yeah, totally killer. It's like 
looks yep. awesome. It's directed by uh, an up-and-coming director. Uh, I think her name is Nanachka Khan. Cool. Uh, she directed Always Be My Maybe. Oh, the Red in the Park movie! And uh, was a showrunner for Fresh Off the Block. Fresh Off the Boat. Boat. Ah, yeah, cool. Boat. Uh, who who was the who was the female lead in that? Always be my baby. Was it, it was, Ali Wong? Yeah, it was Ali Wong. I was like, it was. De- I was like, Aquafina was in it, but it wasn't Aquafina. Though the male lead in that, yep, Randall Park is also in this. Oh, cool. You saw him. He was one of the cops. Yeah, yeah. Also, but you couldn't see him in the trailer, and this is going to be a deep cut for just Jay. Charlie Gillespie. Charlie Gillespie. Name sounds familiar. Uh, he was uh, Luke in Julian the Phantoms. Oh, shit. Oh, man, another fucking lost episode from like a previous iteration of the podcast. Jesus Christ. Nice. Yeah, but this looks interesting. Uh, it's cool to see uh, Kiernan Shipka yep. and to see her like completely off her leash, not having to be, like, dark and mysterious or be kid-friendly. Like, she says fuck in the trailer, like, five times. Yeah. Yeah. And I I love the chemistry between her and fucking... Both her and Claire and her and, uh, like, Olivia Holt's version of uh, Claire's character. (laughs) Fuck off and die. Like... (laughs) Yo, my, my my favorite favorite part of the trailer is the fucking the fucking scene where they're at the fucking clearly a murder cabin. Yeah, and mm-hmm. like you know, Shipka, uh, like <laughs> like Kiernan is being completely logical, and you know it's actually the same white person in this conversation, and it's like you guys. This is, there's a murderer on the loose, and we're in a cabin in the middle of the woods, and then one of her mom's friends is just like, oh no, finally someone gets it. No, I forgot vodka. Oh man. Yeah. That, that was, that was, re- yeah. that was really funny. I also, uh, I also really enjoyed the, the fact that this is just Scream, but with time travel. Because basically, because like it, it the way it, the way it feels is like Claire from Modern Family is the final girl from from a Scream movie, and she's trying she's trying to keep the you know the same shit from happening to her daughter on Halloween, and so you know her daughter's super paranoid. It's like it's like a a campy version of the fight of the subplot. Of the Mike Greenwald Halloween movies, yeah, which I still yeah. I still can't get over how unintentionally funny the second one was. Oh man, evil dies tonight. Uh, but yeah, it's really fun. It looks really fun. I I I think it's gonna be a blast to cover, and it fits the spooky vibe of October. So definitely down. Yeah. Yes, it does. But yeah, speaking about funny and absurd, though, also. Uh... Dream scenario. Yeah, so that one that one felt funny, but also wrong, if that makes sense. Because like it's Nick Cage, Nick Caging, but it felt wrong because he was Nick Caging while also being totally average, which is yeah. which is very un Nick Cage. Yeah. Also, it had a weird horror not horror vibe to it yeah i still don't know what like i don't i don't think it's a horror honestly it, like it feels more just like a black comedy yeah i, I think so too i was just saying that kind of had that unsettling like yeah horror-esque vibe to it but and like a, you said it just fell off and apparently a lot of people want to fuck balding middle-aged dad nicholas cage because Apparently. like from the from the descriptions of some of those ladies, like they were having wet dreams about Midwestern dad Nicolas Cage. Yeah. 
And like, you know, I, I joke, I joked with the guys like, come on, who hasn't dreamed about Nicolas Cage at least once? Cause I, I've actually had a dream, like I've actually had a dream where I was on, on board of Con Air and I had to, I had to help Nick Cage fight off the, fight off the convicts. It was, it was fun doing hood rat shit with Nicolas Cage. Hell yeah. But yeah, that, that was a fun one. Uh, and Aquaman. Yeah, so Aquaman it, it just exists. Aquaman was okay. It, it's the it's the definition of meh. But I have to yeah. give it. I have to give it big props as a pun master. I gotta tip my non-existent invisible hat to whichever fucking trailer editor showing you know Momoa Aquaman broke man. And splicing it with a line of Orem saying, "If you lead, the seven kingdoms will follow." On on first pass, I was the only one who got it, and then I had to replay it, and then Tony got it, and then Brian was still kind of slow on the uptake. I I had to like I had to say it out loud. You just said seven kingdoms again, and it clicked in my brain. Yeah, man, that that was that was fucking funny. So now. Cal Drogo finally gets to live out his dream and conquer the Seven Kingdoms. Yep, and he gets to do it with uh, with a home dude from The Happening. Yeah. And not The Happening. Uh, Condry. Or Condry. His name is like Patrick something. He was also uh, the second night owl in uh, Watchmen. Yeah. Fucking, it's Patrick something. Uh, his name, I know his first name is Patrick. Wilson. Patrick Wilson. Patrick Wilson. Thank you. He's in a lot of stuff also, with Vera uh, Farmiga outside of uh, outside of The Conjuring. He was also Raul in Santa the Opera. Huh. Like the Gerard oh Butler my God. one? Yes, he was. Yeah. He oh, was. shit. Oh, my God. Uh, God. Gerard Butler Phantom of the Opera is a beautiful disaster. It was a beautiful. Mm, with a great theme song. Oh, yeah. I mean, you get Nightwish to do Man. your song. It was... And with the original singer. Yeah, it was the most Andrew Lloyd Webber movie I have ever seen. And if you're a musical theater geek, you know what that means. Because Andrew Lloyd Webber is extra over the top and super up his own ass. He is the most oh, yeah. For real. Um, fucker on the planet. Mm-hmm. But... Black Mana does look like he could be a cool villain, if not one note. Yep. It'll be cool to see more of the brothers together. Yeah. Apparently, for, according to James Wan, the plan for the movie was always to have it be focusing on the brothers and to have uh, Mirror have a smaller role mm -hmm. even before all the stuff came out about the actress. Before her shit hit the fan, or I, I guess their bed. Yes. Also, I will say... One uh, weird thing uh -huh. is that uh, apparently due to scheduling, they couldn't get William Defoe back. Oh, no, Volko! Damn. So they said uh, that uh, they gave uh, Nicole Kidman a bigger part to oh, be cool. the new mentor. Yeah, yeah. Cause, yeah, because she's, cause she's, cause she's fucking Atlanta. Um, so by the way... That makes sense. Did you notice who was playing Atlanta? The king? Oh, uh, you mean Adelaide? Uh, Adeline, yeah. No. Nah. Grandpa from One Piece. Oh, shit, that's Garp. Oh, shit. Yep. Garp. Oh, man. Yeah. That motherfucker. That's crazy. He is also, that character is also the only character in the DCEU to be played by three separate characters. So he gets um, to, he gets three to play, separate actors. he gets to play another um, main character's aggressively Scottish grandpa. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, all this movie has to do to win me over is to have Nanawe be in the movie. Just, just let King Shark show up one time. If you look in the trailer, Nanawe isn't in it, but a hammerhead shark person is. Oh, cool. And they're King Shark, from what I've seen. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so, the, so their King Shark is different from the actual main universe King Shark. Apparently. Also, King Shark, was just, all, King Shark was always a great white, not a hammerhead. What the fuck? I don't I know. I think they said that he's supposed to be, like, from a race of sharks. 
Yeah. If I want to make him a weird, make it a different shark man, that's good on them. Shark man rep. I don't know. Listen. I mean, better. He's a better very... looking physical uh, than uh, I was some just, of the practical. I was, gonna, I, was, I was just about to say, he's probably going to be a better shark man than Arlong. Mm hmm. Which, but uh, anyway, yep. that's it for trailer. Yep. So now we get into the main discussion after fucking three hours of fluff. Which there was an episode to have that much fluff. It's definitely this one. It would um, be this one. You know, I'll, I guess I'll start off right, right off the bat in the spoiler free, like, initial thoughts section. Yeah, this movie was good. And notice the octave there. I. I liked it for sure, but like it was one of those movies where you like unconsciously find yourself on your phone during it. That was that was that was the thing I had, which is why I told the guys I was like, "All right, I'm gonna be real with y'all. I was only half paying attention while watching this movie." I can totally get that, and I agree with what you said, inflection and all. Because mm -hmm. uh, to me, the way to fix this. I feel like would be to tighten it up to about 40 minutes and have it be the first episode of a TV show. Yeah, it felt, th yeah. See, it felt like an I was, extended you know TV what? pilot. That's, that's what it was. I, I was. I was trying to figure out why it bothered me, and I was like, this didn't feel like a movie. This felt like those, you know, back in the day, when they had uh like especially the disney afternoon cartoons where they would put uh like make a two-part pilot so that they could make oh, yeah. so they could make the vhs into a like a like a home video movie even though it's not really a movie it's just two episodes mm -hmm. stitched together that's what this felt like it was two episodes oh, stitched yeah. together like uh back in the day where uh you can buy, like, the VHS of the animated series Mighty Ducks TV show mm -hmm. that was a movie. Yep. But really, it was just, like, the first three episodes yeah. stitched together. Oh, my God. And it hurts my soul knowing that somewhere out there, there are viewers and listeners out there who are probably saying to themselves or saying to their screen and or phone, what the fuck is a VHS? And what are Mighty Ducks? Oh man, Foggy was in it because they or Foggy was in the live action one, not the animated series, but Foggy was in it. Oh, yeah. uh, we we but, are uh, old men we are. compared to some of our audience here. Um, but look, but anyway, but anyway, <laughs> judging uh, by you our guys, analytics, yes. Mm -hmm. You guys aren't gonna get this work probably unless you watched it without telling me. Okay, this also kind of felt like fairy tale version of a uh, of a uh, poker face. Oh. See, did oh, ne that ne Natasha Leone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I, TV I, show? I remember you talking mm -hmm. about it on a on a screen time. Yeah, because because the whole entire thing is that he was the through line person throughout all the story, but it was just like she would walk into a pre established semi universe of characters and say, "Hey, help you solve this murder? Solved it. I'm out." You know, you know, you know what I thought of when I uh, when I watched the movie. Like the whole time it was going through my head, I was like, "This is just Wolf Among Us DLC." You know what? You ain't wrong. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a fairy tale who done it. Like I said, very much like Wolf Among Us. Uh, it has like all the standard noir trappings, and uh, like it was all right. It was all right. It's no Knives Out. It's no Knives Out. Knives Out is still, I think personally, the best executed Agatha Christie style whodunit murder mystery movie. Definitely up there. I still need to see uh, the sequel or sequel. Oh, Glass Onion. Yeah, Glass Onion is pretty good. I think I think Glass Onion is still on Netflix. Yeah, Glass they... Onion is actually, I believe, Netflix owned. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was good. But uh, um, but yeah. But so yeah. Um, also, kind of Tony won't get this reference, but it also kind of had the vibes of uh, Once Upon a Time, just forever in the fantasy world. Yeah, and not just because it's fantasy creatures. Because mm -hmm. Once Upon a Time had that like cheesy but also interesting take on fairy tale characters. Yeah, 
for sure. It, it definitely got really fucky towards the middle and the end because sexy Merlin wanted to, you know, fuck with things as Merlin do. Look, I don't I don't regret covering Once Upon a Time because I, I met some very good friends in that community and it was fun. And also, it was my first experience doing a review where I was mostly making fun of the show. So it was like a precursor to Riverdale. Yeah, it was kind of like Riverdale. The fact that it was good, then it was good to make fun of. And then it was bad. Yep. And, and then, then it, and then it was, you know, and then it was starting to get okay. But nobody else watched that season except for the Once Upon a Time review community and Brian, which I technically kind of was trying to start to be in there. Yeah. But then life, and also it. Yep. Uh, but it was only like ten episodes, and then went away. Yeah. Sad. Uh, with this, I I don't know, man. Like I I I, I honestly just don't have much to say. Uh, like the... uh, Tony, what do you want to say before we get into spoilers? I thought it was goofy, fun, kind of goofy. The costuming I mean, was nice. Yeah, I, I still say to this day, like the uh, the outfits of that particular fairy tale era, it's still boss as fuck, and oh, I yeah. want to wear it. Oh yeah, and people can just mm-hmm. say and that's the one thing I truly can say to this day that I will take to my grave. That fashion is still killer, pun intended. I know they were joking about it, but that prince's outfit. Yeah, no, yeah, that, I, that no, cool I, I I liked it. I liked it honestly. Like the, the costume department was the real star of this movie. Also, uh, it, it's part of. Uh, some of the fun costuming, we actually see a mice man. Like, there's, like, a mouse man. Yep. Fun costuming there. And it's not terrifying like it, like in the abomination that is modern cats. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was okay with that. Character was kind of cringe, but it was done on purpose, but still fine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Overall, like, not for the... It was serviceable. It was basically speed running through a pilot episode of a TV show, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. It, like, to me, it's like, if my tired ass waking up to try to finish the damn thing in like a span of time, if my tired, like first waking up tired ass can actually just focus when these two watched it in the background... Because I watched it. I well, Brian. It, no, I watched it in the background. Brian actually like took time out and like yes. watched it. Watched it. I, I stayed up a little too late to watch it, but I watched it. Misunderstood what you meant, Brian. I apologize. I totally get you. Though I will say one thing about this that was very unique and not in a good way, mm. but not totally bad because. It was somewhat maybe not their fault, but like, you know me, I I typically go for dub over sub when it mm-hmm. comes to all types of uh, stuff. All right. Well, all right. Uh, 30 or 40 minutes into this, I had to switch it over to sub and watch it in the sub. The lip sync was because bad, huh? It was it bad. It wasn't that. It, it, it was kind of that, but also... You know, this is heavy into humor, and it's Japanese humor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, that, that's, it didn't always translate well. That's why I don't watch com- comedy anime in dub unless the comedy features a gyaru. Because that's the only time that shit works. They, uh, D, well, yeah. D. Gray Man's dub fucked up the comedy in D. Gray Man. I will say... uh I don't think this will spoil anything. The moment that made me switch over was the uh, evil laughing scene. Ah. Oh, see. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, see, yeah. The Amer- Americans doing the Ojo laughs that aren't trash is weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even me doing it, uh, it's just, it didn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, no. Also, the Mouse Man's jokes fall flat in English. Also, Tony doesn't have the proper amount of bitch energy for, for the Ojo laugh. 
you got you gotta yeah. you, you gotta you gotta really dig into like cold heart mode and be like like yeah laughing at the peasants I, you gotta laugh at the peasants tony i i i'm too empathetic for that shit to be honest with you Listen, I can turn it off. Like I'm not gonna even try. I can, turn, <laughs> I, I can turn it on and off. I can, I can laugh at the peasants if I want to. Of course you to. can. Look, it's a useful but, skill. But then again, I didn't say it was a bad thing. But then again, Jay and I, and you as well, for like a small bit of time, Brian. Theater kids, we we just get trained into certain roles. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I totally, I totally agree with Tony. This movie is definitely a theater kids movie. So now we're going to go ahead and get into the spoiler portion of the podcast. So I'm going to give you guys your customary uh, spoiler countdown. If you actually care and want to, you know, solve the mystery on your own. Uh, So here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Insert spoiler alert. All right. Um, I think it, I think the movie was well structured in terms of a who done it. Uh, what do you guys think about it? I really enjoyed aspects of this movie. If I have to be perfectly honest, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed like a lot of the fantasy elements. Little Red as the protagonist, yeah, was great. She did amazing. Costuming fantastic. Mm-hmm. The Japanese humor was very good for the most part. Some things I didn't agree that weren't that funny, but still got a small chuckle out of me. Mm-hmm. Wasn't simply funny, but funny. Is do like the like character actions because sometimes when it comes to like differing brands of humor, it's all subjective. Yeah, for sure. I liked aspects of the plot, but it still felt like some stuff was missing. Yeah. No, I, I I definitely yeah. can concur with and that. God damn it. Why does this feel like some I'm missing a few things cuz when the con, like the announcer dude mm-hmm. talked about oh, the great detective uh little like Red Riding Hood. It's like since when has she been a great detective? Yeah, Tell was, me this. I was confused about that too. Explain. I think that was supposed to be a joke like on his part where he just assumed that she was a detective and ran with it. Ah. I mean, I, 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 I could see that being a joke, yes, but... The way it was delivered did not communicate <laughs> joke. Context. Yeah, I hear you. That's all I want. Context. Oh, yeah. Now, once Brian made the TV show comparison, it all clicked in my head of why yeah. I didn't exact... Like, why I like this movie, but why I only liked it when... On paper, and honestly, for the most part, on display, I should have, by all accounts, loved this movie. Yeah. Because, you know, like we mentioned before, this is a fucking theater kid-ass movie. It it has the right yeah. amount of cringe that, you know, theater, pe- theater people are can tolerate, because theater people are just built different when it comes to cringe. Like, our cringe tolerance is a lot higher Compared to the average, average folk. Yeah, you know? I mean, like, one of the most popular series that both Brian and I covered back in the day was High School Musical, the musical, the series. And mm-hmm. we often described that as what would happen if Glee and, and The Office had a awkward little cringe baby. Yeah. And it was still a, it was still a great show. Still so also awkward. very cringe. I never finished it. Yeah, I mean, it it gets it gets really messy because of you know the the IRL stuff, but like yeah, you know, also from right. what I heard, season four, mm-hmm. which is the last season, they focus too much on the returning cast members from the movie. Yeah, yeah. Although Lucas Grabiel uh, Grabiel was talking awesome, and also I'm glad that they finally confirmed in canon in universe ryan was gay because look i was like 10 or 11 somewhere around there when high school musical first came out and even my tiny child ass knew that man's gay as fuck and uh it definitely seemed like at least in the second one Mm -hmm. 
that he had a crush on a Corbin Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. That I don't dance fucking number was filled with sexual tension. Yep. Ah. Uh, but uh. But yeah. You got me thinking now. I was gonna give this show praise because I don't know about you, but I kind of didn't see coming who the killer was. But now I'm wondering if that was clever or because they didn't give us enough breadcrumbs. I personally think it was because they didn't set up enough context for us to piece it together. That's what I meant by breadcrumbs. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I think it's that because that's personally why I didn't see it coming because I was like, all right, but when did we even hint at this person? Yeah, that that was kind of my thought process on the whole situation, too. It's like, huh? Yeah, I, I was like, all right. Ooh? I was like, all right, I know I'm only half paying attention to this movie because I've got work in an hour, but I'm, I, I don't remember anything that would implicate this character. What the fuck? I think to go any further, though, we do need to spoil. I mean, I already gave the spoiler warning. Oh, my bad. I must have spaced out for a second. All good. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but when I initially saw it, I thought the hooded figure was the stepsister. I mean, yeah, I can, I, yeah. I can see, I can see how you'd come to that conclusion. She had the same silhouette, like, mm-hmm. and like body type as the hooded figure, and like. It made the most sense, but... Nah, it was his secret non-girlfriend who, even though she said that they can't be together, she still stalked him. Yeah, like, look, I know in, like, the whodunits, it's always the, like, unsuspecting, in-plain-sight person who's the killer, which is why it's always usually the butler, the maid, or some member of the staff, but... Also, she was such a throwaway character. I didn't. She wasn't even on my radar. Wait, yeah. Jay, because we are in the spoilers now. Who do you think the killer was? Who did I think? I thought that I thought the killer was the stepsister. No, I mean, who? After watching it, who do you think it is? Hmm. You do know that they confirmed who the killer was, right? Did they? I must have. I must, yeah. I, I must have not paid attention to that part. All right, who was it and for real? It wasn't a side character. It, it was, was Cinderella. Yeah. What the? Okay. See, that's totally out of left field. Yeah. So, that, okay. All right. So, did, did they explain <laughs> why? Yes, because apparently, men who died had, it gets a hard on for hair and decided that he wanted to make Cinderella beautiful and wanted her hair. And oh. she was like, nah, don't touch me like that. That's my purse. I don't know you. She hit him on the head with the whetstone. Uh huh. And then decided, you know what? I'm going to frame one of my stepsisters. Yeah, because. Oh, no. Yeah, because if you remember, Jay. Uh huh. If you remember, the stepsister got a note from the hairdresser saying, I want to cut your hair. That yeah. was Cinderella framing her stepsister. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's how she planted the. Oh, okay. So she plants. So you, she used that to plant the hair. Okay, now I'm getting it. Now I'm piecing it together. Okay. And also the a blink and you miss it line from Tucky, the younger of the two witches in this movie. Mm-hmm. Basically, she gave Cinderella another glass slipper, like another set of glass slippers. Mm-hmm. She her stepsister in the head with it because. The heel of that glass slipper was caught in her stepsister's dress. Yeah, because she she hit her with a wet stone to, like, help frame her and put her in the scene. But then she didn't go down at first, so she panicked and used her shoe. Uh, Ah. Okay, so so, so Cinderella took took a lesson from Latin culture. I respect it. Yeah, and also she uh, decided... To bury it in the grave of the pigeon. That makes sense. That 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 part makes sense. Yeah. Also, I was a little I- bit iffy on this, but apparently, I think it was the prince was supposed to come and discover them, but he changed his mind. Okay, I was, de- was I was confused about that one too. It was the thing that 
Cinderella did not account for. Mm-hmm. That he did. That he didn't oh. actually show up. Yeah. That yeah. He didn't actually go and find them. Mm-hmm. Look, see it. It's this. See me figuring this out. Me piecing this together in real time has made it m- infinitely more fun than actually watching the movie. Yeah. So Brian and I sat through it, looked mm-hmm. at it, came to our own conclusions, and just thought to ourselves, "The fuck is this?" Exactly. And then, and then you were talking about it, Jay, and I was like, "An insignificant character." Do you really know who did it? And so then we had to explain. Yeah, yeah, it. no. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah, no, because I was looking at each other across the internet. It's like, yeah, no, I, I, I doesn't feel right. Yeah, no, like I, I look, I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll hold, I hold, I'll hold the L for being totally off. But like again, I was probably the person who paid the least attention while watching this movie. Oh no, it, it's also kind of. Like you said, weird and a little out of left field. It kind of almost feels like, in a way, mm-hmm. like similar to something like D and D, where or some other remakes that we've seen before, where you bog down an established character so that your OC can shine. Mm-hmm. Because after the prince comes and fits the shoe into Cinderella, confirming that she's the killer. Yep. And you think everything's all sad. Red's like, oh yeah, no. Your long lost girlfriend, she's the one that testified on your behalf. You guys can be happily live happily ever after. See, I thought it was sto- oh, I, th- I, th- I thought it was random stalker girlfriend the whole time. No. Yeah, it it could give off that vibe, but here's the dumb part. Okay, it, not necessarily dumb, but it's just some of the most ridiculous bullshit I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm romance trips that i fucking hate it's like oh i feel disfigured you can't love me oh but i love you for who you are on the inside that's what i fell in love with when the scar on her face was just a cut from scissors look man that's exactly look that's that's exactly how i feel about the ready player one movie because like all right let me let me <laughs> let me go let me go on this tangent real quick because this is related so the ready player one movie or in the book uh sam is described as like you know not conventionally pretty right she's she's like very frumpy looking they, they cast olivia cook who for people who people for people who don't recognize the name was allison hightower in the house of the dragon Who's the fuck? Who is like drop dead gorgeous, but then her deformity that gives her this complex about not being a pretty girl was this fucking weird rash on half of her face. Wasn't even like unsettling. Like it wasn't like she was like it wasn't like she was two faced and like burned on like the whole side of her face. It was just like a fucking rash. And I was like, why, why the fuck are you bitching and moaning about being ugly? You're fucking gorgeous. You're Olivia it's fucking like a, cool, girl. Come on. It's like a permanent little sunburn. Yeah. It was fucking it was fucking weird. That movie that movie in general just really and that book really pissed me off. Big incel well, energy. Book, yeah. Very, very big. And Sally vibes from it, the well, book. Uh, especially the sequel to the book. Oh God, the oh. sequel! Whoa. Oh, that oh, that physically hurt me having to think about uh, that sequel again. But but yeah, back to this though. Mm-hmm. Honestly, dude, I can understand how you'd have that miss it because. It definitely took me a while to figure it out, and I was watching it. Cause like for me, right, my, my my like my logic behind it was like this is this is a Japanese movie, and like you have a yandere character, and the yandere can't be with the person that she really loves. Do you know what happens when a yandere can't be with the person she really loves? She goes all stabby she- stabby. Yeah, if you didn't but- let yandere go stabby stabby. They weren't even but a yandere. No. No, she was just placeholder so we can have a happily ever after while subverting the fairy tale. Which is 
Which yeah. is weird. Because, like, you set her up to be a Yondere. Mm -hmm. It's... Well, but, uh, I don't know, man. And also, if you look at that scar, Brian, Jay, uh -huh. if you saw that scene, you would agree with me. That is nothing but a very big paper cut. If you're if you're self conscious yeah. about it, you could. That's easy to hide with makeup. And that's what I thought. And if the people of that country are so goddamn superficial about a goddamn paper cut on your fucking face, you need to move you could to just a different just... kingdom. But see, here's the thing that pisses me off about that. Okay. Okay. Even when the flashback when they showed them together. She said, we can't be together because I'm a commoner and I'm not as pretty. Yeah. And he says, you're the prettiest woman in the world to me. Yeah. And so, oh I, my God. I, yeah, which is why I don't understand the logic of, oh, no, you, you can't love me. I'm a disfigured, horrible beast. And it's just like, bitch, <laughs> he admitted to you early on in your relationship that he doesn't give a fuck about your status or what you look like so why the fuck are you throwing a fit oh uh, it's not also, it's not just the ladies about that trouble that i fucking hate too it's the same thing for dudes and it's like a percentage higher cringier oh, honestly, when it's dudes. Honestly, with, du well with, with dudes, it's a lot more egregious. Like, oh, yeah. I, I, don't oh, know, I don't know God. if you, you guys ever saw the shitty uh, Vanessa Hudgens Beauty and the Beast retelling, Beastly. Oh, God. Ugh. Like, I have it, but it's still. I got, I physically cringe just like, hearing that. Like, Alex Pettifer yeah. and uh, and Vanessa Ashley Hudgens. Bolton. No, Mary Kate. It no, was no, Mary no, Kate. it wasn't Mary Kate. Oh no, no, I'm talking about the one, the movie with Vanessa Hudgens and like the. No, no, Mary Kate was the witch. Oh yeah, Mary Kate was the witch. Yeah, yeah, but fucking like he was all emo and mopey that like you know he was now this you know he went from super pretty boy chad rich guy to ugly deformed monster when all it was was he was bald and had tattoos there, yeah. there are oh girls, my God. there are girls oh my God. there are girls that love bald guys with tattoos yeah like that and, that's all it was and he had like quote unquote scars but they were like Tattoo veiny. That's what I'm saying. The, edge the, runner the, type yeah, scars. They just look like tattoos. And I was yeah. like, I was like, but dog, you're not. <laughs> I will say, uh -huh. I will say that movie does have one good thing going for it. Vanessa Hudgens? No. Uh oh. NPH. Yeah. As the sassy blonde tutor. Oh, NPH. Yeah, NPH. Sassy blonde tutor. N yeah, oh. NP NPH was a was a fucking treasure in that movie. I heard some people say after that movie that uh, they wish that he could play Matt. He could do it. All all you need all you need to do for uh, to play Matt Murdock is to have red hair and to have Mad Riz. And we've seen NPH play Barney. He has Mad Riz. Yeah, yeah. but that, uh, that Riz is on point. See, that's how this movie is. Is it's so lackluster that we just effortlessly tangent away from it constantly Look, because I feel like the tangents oh. are more interesting than the bullshit yeah, exactly. that went on with the movie. Exactly, because at the end of the day, this movie it's not bad, but it's lackluster. Look, it I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say it straight up. I'm gonna say the exact same thing I said about Monkey King. This movie isn't bad, but it's aggressively forgettable. And I'm not yeah. just saying that because I watched it in the background for the most part. Also, and didn't get who the killer was. Yeah. Yes. But also one thing, one thing that I just found really dumb, because I, I, can I just have a small moment to talk about something that I just found so damn stupid? Go off. It, it, okay. So when they're at the ball, right? Uh-huh. And the main stepsister that was giving Cinderella shit, mm -hmm. Anne, which that dress, girl, that color of green doesn't look good on you. Yeah, who? 
Who hurt you? No. Your mama hates you, girl. Point being, when she was like pushing up her chest, they hear the you hear a bounce sound. Uh -huh. Which in anime, that's fine. But hearing that shit in live action, I cringed a little inside. Yeah, like, look. It works for One Piece, because One Piece is supposed to be goofy and cartoony, so, like, the live action having the dumb sound effects was actually charming and endearing. But, like, doing the anime ecchi sound effects for a, a real-life bit is just weird. It wasn't just that, though, because the weird sound effects also were in other stuff, too, like uh, when uh, she ran into the thorns. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's also, because she was making those sounds. Because she hurt herself on the thorns. But... I thought the thorns made a weird sound. Anyway, well, go on. But the point I'm trying to make is, okay, it is fine because it's meant to be more of a comedy. I get that. However, when it's egregious, and you just let it play for a little too long, like a few seconds, then yeah. I would let it slide. Yeah, they, but they, they linger a lot. They linger a lot on jokes. They, they really had to linger on the bit when she was done pushing up her own chest. Then her mama did it to her. I'm like, okay, we are done with the bit. You you went too far. You went too long. Done. Nada. Yeah. No. No, like, all right. So I, I think I, I think I figured it out now. Like what uh, how I think this uh, this movie could be could have been fixed. If this movie was instead a, like, 12-episode comedy anime or a four-coma manga, I think it could work. Yeah, or a four-coma anime adaptation. I would accept yeah, it yeah. if it was an adaptation of a four-coma manga that mm. would deal with murder. It, it would be fine. It would be fine. But no, they made it a fucking hour and 45-minute long movie that felt like two episodes stitched together rather poorly because, my God, some pacing moments were just odd as fuck. Yeah, no, like, for real. Yeah, I, I, I will uh, agree with that. I got some, I, I got some flashbacks to Ahsoka, uh, like, at, at the times I was paying attention. Uh, also, I do want to say that, uh, Tony, you talking about the scar made me think about something else. Uh, what, what did I do to remind you of shenanigans, Brian? One of the things that made Red... Realize that Remy was attacked it was a prominent blood stain that had been dried for for over a year. Mm -hmm. Yet that blood stain came from that small cut. Yeah, like, you know what? That's oh, true. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? No, I, I've seen blood marks same places. Oh, also, no, also, no, my like. My guy, you're a prince. You don't fucking take your shit to the royal dry cleaners in a year? No, 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 no. It was in the royal hairdresser's house. Ah. Uh, it, it was, was on, on the, the floor. floor. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, motherfucker, whose name was Hans, by the way. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course, he had to be a creepy, creepy goober named Hans. <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. one, of, one, one, one of the most celebrated fairy tale authors always relegated to a creepy villain for some reason. Or a rather cringe villain. Yeah. Thanks, Disney. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that, Disney. We finished each other's sandwiches. I'm Man, sorry, gonna... look, they could have fixed the Hans problem if they had turned, like, if they had made, like, a, you know, Jafar style Disney villain evil reprise of love is an open door that would have it wouldn't have made hans good but it would have like upped his villain stocks for me yeah he would have gone off in villain stonks but no for this movie though you know folk you know gentlemen we should probably just get to the ratings and yeah 
Yeah. Well, good folks at home just kind of relax to yeah. themselves. Look, man, we, we, so, we've tangented enough. I, I hope you've enjoyed this tangent. It's nowhere near as long a tangent as me and Tony unpacking our romantic woes on the How I Met Your Father episode. Yes, but at least these tangents were fun and somewhat yeah, funny. Yeah, and it was, and it was like yeah. a, a nice trip down memory lane for, for us. Uh, but yeah, yeah. yeah, let's start with Brian. What is yeah, your yeah. rating and your thoughts? Like I said, this was somewhat good, and it would have been better as a pilot. And I know you were talking about two-part pilot. Mm -hmm. No, I think this could have been good as just trimmed down the whole thing to one episode of a show. Yeah. Pilot. Mm -hmm. And have the show just be her going to different fairy tales, yeah, figuring like, out like, murders. Like, just cut out the last 40 minutes, make this like an hour-long episode pilot. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, that probably yeah. would fix a lot of the problems. Yeah, trim up the pacing... Stuff like that. But uh, as it is, as we have seen, I think honestly, because I don't remember it's been a while, I might unintentionally be giving this the same rating that I gave Monkey King. Okay. But I do think this is just slightly better than that one movie. But in the end, I feel like after talking about it with you guys and figuring out all the negatives, I've got to give it a 6.5. Okay. Okay. All right. So, Tony, what, did, what were your final thoughts and ratings? This could have been a lot more entertaining. I mean, it was entertaining, but it could have been so much more. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel you. Yeah. It was like, yeah. I'm like a disappointed parent when I was when I'm told at the parent teacher conference that my child didn't push themselves on a test or an assignment that I know for a fact they could they're really good at. You know what makes this hilarious? I'm just disappointed. No, like, you two are making, both making the exact same analogies that you made when we talked about Monkey King. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, so, rating, Tony? I, I would actually give it a much better rating than I did uh, Monkey King. When I said it was a flat six for Monkey King, mm -hmm. this is a seven. This is just a seven quality. Mm -hmm. It's better than what I felt about when it came to Monkey King. Mm -hmm. I will tell, tell you all that. But I, I got more enjoyment out of it. So mm -hmm. I'm giving it the seven. But it could have been just that much more better mm -hmm. if they really applied themselves to the comedy and mystery angle. Because it can be done. Oh, yeah. It's just... A funny, a funny murder mystery can be a thing. Like, uh, the Hulu show, Only Murderers in the Building, is really funny. And also, the concept of a fairy tale murder mystery. Yeah. Sounds really cool. Uh, yeah. Like, like, you know, we were excited about this movie, like, when we, like, when Brian had suggested it and, like, you know, ran it by us. And we were like, oh, fuck yeah, that sounds awesome. And, you know, we all ended up disappointed so i guess I'll, that'll transition into me i'm actually gonna tie with brian on this one and give this a 6.5 it's aggressively meh but i didn't hate it so i can't like bring it down to like a five yeah i didn't hate it but also thinking about all the negatives i couldn't for me at least personally couldn't give it a seven mm-hmm same, yeah. Seven, seven, seven felt too high for me, uh, but six felt too low. So I, I'm with, I, you know, I just, I decided to, you know, side with Brian on this one and go with the six point five. Yeah. And I, and I could see your guys' point about that, but mm -hmm. after my experience with Monkey King, and that to me was more aggressively mid. Oh yeah. Than this. No, I, no, I, I, I feel you. So, yeah. I, I honestly just had to go with my gut Look. and. As, as someone who gave it a in, flat six, I, I understand. In hindsight, I'd actually think that I'd give Monkey King a lower score. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't get it twisted, folks. This movie is worth your time if you have free time to kill. But I hope you're a theater person. Either a theater person or a costume person. Because like Tony said, most of the costumes here are, like, gorgeous. Except, yeah, the except two, for that unfortunate The two fairy godmothers? Oh, dude, they killed it. Oh, yeah. I, I think, personally, their outfits are fun because uh, Barbara's 
goofy tassels on uh, her uh, the front part of her design is just mm. so true and i love it yeah it's it's very whimsical I mean, yeah the actress themselves was very extra and i was here for it mm-hmm. i loved it every minute of it yeah extra. and they were good like yin and yang yeah yeah like, like look folks if you don't like the like over the top very theatrical performances this movie's not for you mm. It's very much, you know, like we said repeatedly, it's a, it's a, it's a theater, it's a theater person's movie. Like, and also, if you don't find Japanese humor that funny, yeah, you're, which, yeah, you're probably not gonna like this. Yeah, I mean, for us, we we all love Japanese humor in our own little special ways. Yeah, I mean, so. yeah, Brian, Brian grew up in Japan. Tony and I love comedy anime. It's it's definitely its own sensibilities. It's like it's like trying to recommend a British comedy to people. If you don't like the British dry, very deadpan humor, you're not going to enjoy a British comedy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like it's a, the same principle kind of applies. So, you know, view at your own discretion, folks. But we hope you enjoy this tangent filled episode of the Channel Tasters podcast. But next week we won't have something, you know, to tangenty because we're actually interested in the show we're covering next week. Brian, tell the folks at home what we're covering next week. Well, Jay kind of hinted at it earlier. We're actually staying in the same country of origin. We are covering the anime My Happy Marriage. Yeah, I'm Which... I, I'm excited because like there there there's some there's some crazy shit going on, and I'm only on episode three. Yep, and I've been uh, pushing back my watch through of the show itself because I haven't watched episode eight yet. Mm-hmm. So it would be easy for me to play catch up. I mean, with anime, you could easily catch up. Oh, it's yeah. Like, that difficult. But, but, unless it's one. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't watched all of it. Unless it's one piece. Uh, but yeah, but, I hadn't watched any of my happy marriage, but I've heard good things. Oh, yeah. And it is. I'm easily marathon. No. Yeah, anime, it's a an, anime is anime is baby mode when it comes to binge watching. I mean, shoot, like uh, you know, if any of you guys are fr- uh, from my Twitch community by any chance, you guys know back when back when like you know the regulars had a lot more free time, we would you know constantly do anime nights where we would fucking watch an entire season of a show in in one sitting. I mean, that's how I ended up watching a Dress Up Darling. Yep. Which, that is a great show. Yep. And a great mom. Also, shout out to Mayumi, because we got her to watch the feels bomb that is Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai. Oh my god. And for the deepest of cuts, for those of you who recall us mentioning this, Jay and I, on my once thriving youtube channel did an anime podcast with our buddy jordan yep. and this was one of the things that made us three grown men cry like children oh yeah dude like it, it was a, it was a whole experience because like we, we we found out the movie came out at the same time and we just started like we op- we opened up a group dm on discord and we're like we're like okay everybody start at the same time all right three two one go and we all got to the part at relatively the same time and we were mm-hmm. like all right can we just, can we jump in a voice call real quick i, I don't know how to process this i my my mm-hmm. soul left my body uh, i was so filled with emotion and then jordan fucked us up even more when we discovered the genius marketing tactic of that movie clever bastards oh man look look man if if you are like me and are an emotional masochist and need to watch sad things to remind you that you're human what you need to watch are Two things, maybe three. I have three on a list, like that are for sure work for this, uh, like these parameters. Fucking Rascal doesn't dream of Bunny Girl Senpai, and of course the movie that's mandatory. Uh, Violet Evergarden. Also fantastic. Yep, and also a feels bomb. And all you know for mm-hmm. for old school anime fans, and it hurts me to say that this is old school, but it's old school now. Clan Ad After Story. Oh dear God. Oh dear God. 
I didn't exactly watch it, but I watched like a video essay about it. Oh man! It, no, that, no, Clan Ed is an experience that you have to watch for yourself. Video yep. essay. They could give you the general idea, but experience it for yourself. It's a different experience oh, entirely. Exactly. Oh no! It was a. It was one of those several hour. Uh, oh, super deep dive. Mm. It was like back during the Channel Awesome day. Ah, gotcha. You know, it was one of their anime people. You know what I realized? Yeah. You know what I realized was my, my first feels bomb anime was fucking. Uh, what was it? What was it? What was it called? No. It, it was the one about the the group of friends that disbanded because... Oh, I know exactly what you're Anohana. talking about. Anohana. There it yes. is. Yes, I remember. It's like, that show, goddamn, man. Yeah, because I, cause you hadn't seen it. I convinced you to watch it, and you hated me for about a week. Yeah, there's a also, lot of things that make me big sad that you always have to remind me of. Yep. Which also, uh, old school sad anime, but movie instead of a TV show... Grave of the Fireflies. You know, Grave of the Fireflies was the first Ghibli movie I ever watched, and that should explain Ooh. that should explain a lot. What well, could also explain a lot. You know what my first one was? Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. My neighbor Totoro. Oh, um, yeah. No, that checks. That checks out. That checks out. Uh, but yeah, my happy marriage. Look forward to that because there's a there's a lot to discuss. There's going to be actually a, a like a much deeper discussion and tangents, but no, it, like not so irrelevant but relevant tangents as we did in this one because we don't need to fill time for analytics purposes. No. Uh, yeah. It would be proper tangents because of like story reasons, interesting yep. lore, and and, they do. and gushing about the fucking beauty of this fucking animation. Because God, this is it, it's so gorgeous. Netflix it has is. not Netflix has not put out a show this pretty ever, and it kind it pisses me off that this show is so pretty because how do you have this and then give us fucking record of ragnarok bruh that's, also that's night and day also how do you have something that's pretty and do all that when you don't pay your fucking writers yeah uh, i mean no, to be fair netflix netflix wasn't the one writing this they just outsourced a, a japanese studio and bought the rights Ooh, i know but i just felt like i needed to draw in Look, some no 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 of that, that, that since that, we've been praising netflix no that that criticism is still warranted because the japanese anime industry is full of a bunch of you know fucking uh, slave driving assholes who will not um, let people see their families those poor mappa bastards have been locked in the art basement for like seven years yeah just to animate fucking gojo doing light skinned things and just god tier animation they subsued themselves off of cocaine and anime hype like that's the yeah, only way I yeah, can explain Netflix. it. Yeah, Netflix. Mm -hmm. Pay your writers and your actors. Yeah, for sure. You know, on a positive note, Happy Marriage is going to be a very good episode. Um, it's going to be way more focused. At least, you know, I'm going to intend for it to be way more focused. There's a, just, Go there's, back to a more structured review. Yeah, and there's a, mm -hmm. there's actually a lot more stuff to talk about. I, I went on and on about world building earlier when I went on my Ahsoka rant, but like, this show does some fantastic world building in just the first episode alone. It's crazy. Uh, so look forward to it. Watch it. Uh, by the time you see this episode, the final episode will be out. So go binge it. It's worth it. Uh, show Netflix that we actually care about the good anime they put out so they stop putting things in Netflix jail and they won't kill the hype for a fan favorite franchise for a part that was already underappreciated, but now is even more underappreciated because you killed the hype for it. Sorry, we were talked about JoJo already, so I had to get that one out there. I'm still angry at Netflix for that. And hey, it's typical of this episode to end on a tangent. Yep. Until then, we'll see you on the next tangent on the following episode of the Channel Chasers podcast. Until then, peace. When we will return is a mystery. Not really. It's next Tuesday.